Do you want to build an event organization web app like Eventbrite or Meetup with authentication, events, related and organized events, search and filtering, categories, checkout and payments with Stripe, event orders with search, and build it using and learning Next.js 14 with newly stable server actions, Tailwind CSS for easy styling, ChatCN, React hook form, Zod, Upload Thing for easy file upload, React Date Picker, Mongoose, Clark, and Stripe. Let me walk you through the app so you can see how it works. We have a cool homepage that anyone can visit publicly without an account. Right under this hero section, you can see a list of events made by people worldwide. Some you pay for and some are free. You can search or pick a category you're interested in. There is this pagination as well, through which you can keep on exploring the whole library of events. If you click on one of the events, it takes you to the page showcasing all the details. When and where is it? Links and other similar events. If you try to buy a ticket without signing in, it'll prompt you to create an account. We built our auth with Clerk in just a few minutes. Clerk is my go-to auth solution for Next.js apps since it's easy to set up and on top of regular auth, it also offers complete user management. You can also turn on all the most popular social auth options like Google, GitHub, and a dozen more with a simple toggle and save so much time. I'll go ahead and create an account here. And now after successful authentication, we're back on the homepage as an authenticated user. Now, if you hit buy, it takes you to a page where you can see what ticket you're getting and buy it using Stripe. After you complete the order, you'll end up on your profile page and you can see the ticket you got. Pretty cool. You can also make your own event by giving all the info, name, picture, category, description, where, when, and if it's free. And once you make it, everyone will be able to see it. There are many options, including update, where I can update any information related to the event or even delete it. There is also this order details option where we can see a list of people who got the tickets. There we have it a nice looking table showcasing the order details. Awesome, right? And we made sure the app works well on all kinds of devices, as you see. If you're into building modern web applications running Next 14 and higher with all of these amazing features, including payment processing, this video is for you. The requirements for this tutorial are knowledge of JavaScript and React and a bit of Next.js. So if you're unfamiliar, check out our React and Next.js crash courses. No TypeScript knowledge required. With that said, let's get started. We're going to start by creating an empty folder on our desktop. We can call it Evently, or feel free to think of your own name. And then you can drag and drop it to your empty Visual Studio code. We're going to build everything you've seen in the intro, complete auth, CRUD operations for events, related events, organized events, search, filtering, categorizations, even payments using Stripe. And of course, we're going to use the best tech stack to do it. So without any further ado, let's dive right into the project setup. Of course, we'll use Next.js, the React framework for the web. And we can get started by using it by going to nextjs.org and then conveniently copying this command right here. To open up the terminal, you can go to view and then terminal, and then simply paste the command we copied, mpx create next app, add latest, and then add the dot slash to create it in the current repository. It's going to ask us whether we want to install the latest version of Next.js, in my case, 14.0.4. That's looking good to me. And it's going to ask us a couple of questions. In this case, we would like to use TypeScript, yes, and I know that you might think, oh, but I didn't really properly learn TypeScript, but no worries for that. TypeScript is just an upgrade to JavaScript and a lot of huge companies are using it. So you can watch this video without any previous knowledge of TypeScript. I'm gonna teach you how to write some of the types. So let's press yes. For ESLint for now, we're gonna press no. We will use Tailwind CSS. We are not gonna use the SRC directory. We don't need it. The app router, of course, is going to be there and we don't need to customize the default import alias. With that said, it's going to install just three dependencies, React, React DOM, and Next, as well as some additional dev dependencies. At the same time, the entire file and folder structure will be created. 
Of course, the thing that we're mostly concerned with is the app. This is where our entire application will go. And there we go, the app has been set up. What we can do immediately after is run npm run dev. This is going to run the application on localhost 3000. Let's control click it to open it up. And you should be able to see a page that looks like this. And I know if you're watching this, you might be like, hey, Adrian, I know what you're doing. Let's just get to the project. But I want to make sure to explain everything in depth. We're starting slow, but trust me, we're going to dive into the details real soon. The next thing we have to do is install ShadCN, which is going to be our component library of choice. It's built on top of Radix UI and natively supports Tailwind CSS. So you can build all of these modern looking, minimalistic, yet functional components. And that's exactly what we're going to use it for. So let's click get started. And let's go to installation. We're going to install it for Next.js. And it's going to give us the command we can run. We have already created our next app, so we can simply copy the second command. Going back, we can create a new side-by-side -side terminal. In there, you can say mpx ui at latest init. It's going to ask us which style we would like to use. Let's go with default. Let's use slate. It's going to ask us where our global CSS file is, which is great. We would like to use CSS variables. And it's going to ask us where our Tailwind config file is created. We're going to say that it's going to be under tailwind.config, but .ts instead of JS, because we're using TypeScript. And we can simply press Enter for all of the future steps. Finally, press Y, and then it's going to create it. Now that our project has been set up, let me tell you a bit more about why I love ShadCN. First of all, it's incredibly light it's not going to install almost anything to your code base. You will be able to add everything on your own. So you will be able to specifically choose which components from their library you want to use, such as a button, and then they're going to add the code for that button directly within your code. You're not going to import it as a package, rather the code will be added. So let's try it out. We can copy this command right here, paste it. That's going to be mpx ui at latest add button. The button is getting installed and done. If we now go to our file tree, right below the app, there's components, and then there's a UI folder with a button. You can see that's a lot of code for a button, but don't worry, you never have to dive into this button. This was created by ShadCN. If you want to, you can modify it, but in most cases, you don't have to. And let me tell you why. The way we use this button is by simply importing it as a component. So let's go to our homepage by going to our app and then page. Let's remove everything we have right here by deleting the main and then recreating it right here. Within it, let's render a new button component, which we can automatically import right here by clicking it or by pressing enter. And then we can simply say something like, hello. Now, if we save this, and go back to our app, there we go, a beautiful looking hello button. In case you wanna style it, you can use some of the predefined variants, such as variant destructive, which is going to be for delete. There we go, that's a delete. But what's cool about it is that we can use native Tailwind CSS class names. So in case you wanna add something like a padding horizontal of something like 10, which would be huge, you just add it like a normal class name, and now you can see that the padding was added, which allows you to really easily style all of our components. Now, a couple of things here. If I hover over padding X of 10, I can see proper CSS styles that are getting applied based off of this class name. And this is being provided to me by an extension that I installed. So if I go to extensions and search for Tailwind CSS, you'll be able to find a Tailwind CSS IntelliSense package that's going to give you just that. It's going to tell you exactly what CSS styles are being applied when you type. Pretty cool if you're new to Tailwind or you just want to debug it. Now, another thing that I have is sometimes these Tailwind CSS classes get long, which is okay, but in case you don't want to look at them and you don't want them to go over your lines, you can install this package that simply hides them. So when you're not looking at them, it's going to simply give you three dots. If you click it, it's going to expand it. 
and that package is called inline fault. So in case that's something you want, you can simply install it. With that said, we have almost everything we need to start turning this empty localhost page to the final Evently website that's not only a pretty landing page, but a fully functional event management system with login functionality as well as payments using Stripe. So without any further ado, let's set up our design system, meaning some CSS utility classes we'll use to improve our coding workflow. We can do that by first modifying our globals.css file within the app. Here, we have some default Tailwind classes, as well as some overrides for future components. So in the readme of this app, you'll be able to find a modified globals.css file. Simply copy it and paste it right here. Once again, we'll still be doing all the styling. We just have some helper classes to make her life easier. Similarly, there's a tailwind.config.ts file, which we also need to override. This is going to allow us to specify some custom colors, as well as some specific font families. And now at the top of this file, you're gonna notice that we have something called upload thing forward slash TW. Upload thing is a package that allows for simple file uploads for Next.js developers. We're gonna use it to upload our great event images. And it has a special configuration with Tailwind. So to get rid of this error, the only thing we need to do is go right here to our open terminal and run npm install upload thing forward slash TW. So the only thing we have to do to get rid of this error is open up the terminal and run npm install upload thing forward slash react. So the only thing we have to do to get rid of this error is open up our terminal and run npm install upload thing as well as add upload thing forward slash react and press enter. And as soon as it gets installed or even before, you can notice that the error is gone and we're good to proceed. So let's close all of our styles, go to our homepage, add an H1 that's going to have a class name equal to text dash for Excel, which is going to provide us with a big font size. And we can say something like evently, or you can figure out a better name. If we save it back on our local host, you'll still be able to see an error. That's okay, it happens from time to time that whenever you install some new dependencies, you have to rerun your application. So that's the first pro tip of the day. I try to scatter as many of these tips as possible. So I'm gonna terminate this, and then I'm gonna rerun it by running npm run dev. It's not a big tip, but trust me, sometimes you can spend hours and hours trying to fix something in your code where you just had to rerun your terminal. And now if you go back to our application and reload, you should be able to see evently and then a delete button, which we don't really need at this point in time. We just need an H1. And as a matter of fact, we don't even need that because here is where our entire application will be with the nav bar, our great hero section, and then finally we'll display the events there. So now that we have this page, we're gonna do something with it. I'm not gonna leave it right here within the app folder, which is where you think it might be, Rather, what I will do is create a route group by creating a new folder and then wrapping it in parentheses. We're gonna call it root. This is where all primary pages of our application will be. And with those, our original page as well. The reason why we wanna do this is because we're gonna also have another route group called auth, inside of which we're gonna have all of the sign up and sign in related routes. This is just to keep your file and folder structure clean. What we will keep in our app is the layout. This is where we can provide a title, a description, and some additional details such as fonts, which are gonna be used across the entire application. So let's get started by using our first font, which is going to be called Poppins. We can replace it right here to say Poppins, and we can utilize it right here by saying Poppins. We're gonna use a subset of Latin, but we're gonna also require some additional things. We're gonna ask it to give us different font weights. That's going to be weight of 400, 500, 600, and 700. And we also wanna create a CSS variable for this font, which is going to be set to dash dash font dash poppins. There we go. 
And now we can use that font right here within our body by saying poppins dot variable, which is going to apply it across the app. Let's also change our metadata a bit right here. You can give it a title. I'm going to go with evently, and you can also give it a description. Anything will do. In this case, we can do evently is a platform for event management. We can also give it icons where we're going to specify one icon specifically, which is going to come from our assets. And I'm happy to say that it took some time to prepare all of the assets we'll be using to build this project. The logo on the top, as well as all of the graphics we have right here. So to download them, go to the same readme file where you found those styles at the start and download the zipped public folder. Once you download it, unzip it, delete the old public folder, and then simply paste it by going right here, clicking it, and then pressing paste. Make sure that it is below the node modules. In there, you'll see our favicon, which you can then immediately drag and drop to our app and override the initial favicon we had. And also in here, you have all of the assets, which we're going to use later on. So immediately right here under icons, you can use the forward slash assets, forward slash images, forward slash logo dot SVG. So now if we save this, go back and reload, you can see that now it says eventually, and it also has this nice icon. This has been the layout for all of our pages, meaning both the pages in the auth section and the root pages. But I want to teach you an additional Next.js Pro tip. And that is that you can create new layouts only for specific route groups, which is another reason why we had to separate it in a route group. So within root, we're going to also create a new layout.tsx. This layout is going to be similar to the last one. So you can simply copy this entire root layout and then paste it right here. But in this case, remove this class name from the body. We don't need it because we have already defined the font in our original layout. So we don't have to redefine it here. Now the question is, why do we need this second layout? And the answer is simple. All of our pages here, like the home page, the event page, as well as the profile page later on, have the nav bar and a footer. But if you notice our authentication pages, we don't have a nav bar and a footer there. So rather than simply copy and pasting the nav bar and the footer in all of the home pages and our event pages, we can simply define them as part of the root layout. That means that we have to create two new components and use them within here. So under components, we're going to create a new folder within the components folder called shared components. So now we have the UI which is where the chassis and components will be. And we have our own shared components right here. Within it, let's create a new header dot TSX, as well as a footer dot TSX files. Within them, we can run RAFCE, which is a command that quickly spins up a simple React functional component. And if this command didn't work for you, go to extensions and type ES7 plus Redux React, React Native snippets. Install it, and then you'll be able to do it. Now let's also go to Heather and run RAFCE. There we go. And now we can import those two components within our layout. But again, make sure that you're in the root layout. Here, we're going to create a header component, which we can immediately import by doing it automatically while typing out the component name, just by clicking on this path, which is going to do it. Or the other way to automatically import it is to just type it out and then select that component and press control or command space and then press enter. It's going to import it. Next.js's IntelliSense is great. So now if you go to our deployed website, you'll be able to see a header and a footer there. The next thing we can do is remove HTML from here because we have it in our other layout, but we can turn this into just a regular div and we can properly close it right here at the end. That div is going to have a class name equal to flex h dash screen for full height and flex dash call. So the elements show one on top of another, and we can rename the body to main and give it a class name equal to flex dash one. Now we can dive into our first component of the day, which is the header and get started with implementing it.
Let's put our editor side by side by our browser. This way, we'll be able to see the changes that we make live. And our header component is more exciting than usual navbars. This header is going to allow us to create an account or log in with a single click. And that's because we're going to use Clark. And this header is going to be a bit more exciting than usual headers because we're going to implement a button that handles authentication, but more on that soon. So with that said, our header is going to be an HTML5 semantic header tag with a class name equal to w full for full width border dash B for a border bottom. Within the header, we're going to have a div and that div is going to have a class name equal to wrapper. And if you hover over the wrapper, it doesn't really say anything. So we're not sure what this class is for. That's because it's one of our custom classes we have added within our globals.css. So if you go to the global CSS, press control or command F and then search for the wrapper here, you can see which classes is it applying. It's applying a max width as well as a margin auto, some padding, some more padding, and then padding across different devices. So if you're ever wondering what some of the classes we add mean, simply go to the global CSS and find them there. With that said, we also want to make this a flex container that's going to have the items center as well as justify between. Right within this div, we want to show our first link. This link is going to come from next link. So you know the drill, control or command space, and then you simply auto import it, not from Lucid React, but from next link, of course. Every link has to have an href. And in this case, it's going to be just the forward slash because it's going to point to home. We can also give it a class name equal to w-36 for width. This is about 144 pixels. This link is also going to render a Next.js image, which again, we need to import from next image. And it's going to have a source of forward slash assets, forward slash images, forward slash logo dot SVG. We can also give it a width of about 128, as well as the height of 38. Of course, every image also has to have an alt tag. So let's give it an alt of evently logo. There we go. Our image is looking good. Now, right below this link, we want to render a div. And this div is going to have a class name equal to flex. It's going to have a W-32, a justify end because we want to move it to the end of the container and the gap of three. Inside of here, we want to start setting up clerk the easiest and the most comprehensive way to set up authentication within your apps. Or as they like to put it, more than authentication, complete user management. So to properly follow along with me using Clark and building it out, click the link in the description where it says Clark. And that's going to take you to the sign up page. So either create an account or sign up. And once you're there, add an application, then you can choose your application name. In this case, we're going to do evently. And clerk will automatically build your sign in component for you by choosing how you want your users to sign in. In this case, we can do email as well as Google. Let's press create application. Right after you'll be redirected to your homepage where we have a quick start for all different kinds of applications. In this case, of course, we're going to proceed with Next.js. So let's copy our ENVs and let's add them to the .env.local. We don't have that file yet, so let's create it in the root of our directory by saying .env.local and let's paste them right here. After you do that, you can click continue in docs. Here, we can see all the steps needed to set up our clerk. So instead of me telling you what to do to set this up, what I like to do is for us to go through the documentation together. That's the way you're truly going to learn. And let's be real. That's the way you'll be developing apps in the real world as well. So first we have to install clerk Next.js. Let's copy the command, open up the terminal and paste it right here and press enter. I'm going to zoom this out and give more space to our terminal inside of which we're installing commands. The other terminal is still running our app. 
there we go, it has been installed. Then set the environment keys, which we have already done. And then we have to wrap our app in the Clark provider. So to do that, we simply have to go to our source app layout and then import Clark provider and wrap our entire app with it. So we can go to our app and then layout. If we go down, we simply need to wrap our HTML with Clark provider, which we can auto import from Clark Next.js. And we can properly close our app like this. Okay, that is done. And we have the import at the top. Now that Clark is installed and mounted in our app, we also need to create a middleware.ts file. So let's copy their middleware and let's add it to the root of our directory. Middleware.ts and paste what we copied. Now immediately they ask you to try visiting your local host now. It will redirect you to the sign up page. Let's give it a shot. If we go here and reload, we are redirected to the sign in sign up modal. How cool is that? And you didn't even have to set up any guards or redirections or the modal or heck even creating the modal and hooking up the Google auth to it. It was all done for us. Not to mention that if we go to clerk right here and then go to user and authentication and choose social connections. I believe that there's more than 30 of these here that you can choose. I mean, Discord, TikTok, Slack, GitHub, they are all here. So you can choose to add any of these just with a single click. As a matter of fact, let me give it a shot. If I click GitHub here and press save and now go back and reload, that's it. We just added GitHub. This is what I mean when I say that clerk is the easiest way to add auth to your apps but also the most comprehensive because with a couple of clicks, you can add all sorts of different functionalities to your user management. So with that said, let's set up our middleware properly for our own application. We want to expand this auth middleware, and then we want to set public routes because we want our users, even if they're not logged in to be able to visit specific routes. We can do that by saying public routes is equal to an array off forward slash. We're going to also have forward slash events forward slash. And then the ID of that event, the next one is forward slash API forward slash webhook forward slash clerk. And we can duplicate that below to create forward slash API forward slash webhook forward slash stripe for once we implement payments. And also we want to do one for our image upload by saying API upload thing. We also want clerk to ignore some routes so we can add them to the ignored routes, which is also an array. And we wanted to ignore these last three that we added above. So we can simply paste them here. Great. Our clerk middleware is set up and believe it or not, this is all it takes for you to add clerk to your application. But now let's try to log in directly from our header. That's what we wanted to do in the first place, right? So let's collapse this back. And let's utilize the clerk package we have installed. We can do that by using a special component called signed out. Of course, we have to import it from clerk next.js. Within it, we can render a button. Of course, we have to import it from UI button because that's a Shatzian component. It's going to have the as child prop as well as a class name equal to rounded dash full and a size equal to LG. Inside of there, we can render a link that we have to import from next link. So let's try to find it right here. Oh, for some reason it cannot find it. Oh, that's because it's already imported and we can give it an href that's going to point to forward slash sign in and the link itself can say login. Now, if we save this, you can immediately see a login button appear on top. And now if you click login, you're immediately redirected to our modal. But check out the URL. It's not our local host. We are redirected to some weird URL string. So how can we make this actually point to forward slash sign in? Well, clerk makes it super simple. We're going to go to our auth route group and create a new folder called sign in. 
within it, we want to create another folder that's going to be called, bear with me, double square bracket, dot, 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 sign dash in, and then close double square bracket. Within that folder, we want to create a new file of page.tsx. The only thing you have to do there is say export default function page, and then you return the sign in component, which we have to import from clerk next.js. Let's also copy this and replicate it for our sign up. So go to auth, right click it and create a new folder, sign dash up. Within sign up, create a new folder of double open square bracket, dot 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 sign dash up, close it. Within it, create a new page, dot tsx, and paste what we had so far, but replace sign in with sign up. There we go. So it's going to look something like this once you're done. Now, if we close all of these files, there is one last thing that we have to do to make it work. So let's head to the docs. And if you scroll down, you can see create custom sign in and sign up pages. We have already went through the step one and two, which is building our sign in and sign up pages. But now we also have to update our environment variables. So let's copy these env.local, then go to our env local right here and paste it below. Now, as they say, you can just go to the sign in or sign up, or in our case, even better, just click the button. And if you pay attention, you can see that now we are at localhost 3000 sign in, and we have the same clerk modal. Now to make it look just a bit better, we can create a third layout file. Yep, see how important those layouts are. Who would have said, right? This layout is going to be for our auth. So both the sign in and the sign up. So let's create a new layout dot TSX. Now within this layout, we can say const layout is equal to where we have a component that accepts children. Since we're using TypeScript, we have to define a type where children is of a type react dot react node. And then the only thing it has to do is return something, which in this case will be a div. And then finally, we're going to wrap all the children within it. And of course, we have to export default layout. If you do that and save, you can see that we have the same thing we had before, but this now allows us to style this div by giving it a class name equal to flex dash center min dash h dash screen. That's going to center it w dash full bg dash primary dash 50 to turn it into our own colors bg dash dotted dash pattern bg dash cover bg dash fixed and bg dash center. It is as easy as that. And now we have those dots behind, which is going to be the theme for our entire app. What clerk also allows you to do is to require users to enter their username. So let's go right here to users and authentication, email, phone, and username, and then request them to add a username and click apply changes. And this is all it takes to get from nothing to a fully functioning authentication with email and social sign in in less than seven minutes. Now let's create our first account by going to sign up and I'm going to continue with Google. On the second screen, I'm prompted to add my username. So I'm going to say JavaScript mastery and press continue. And we're back in our application, but as you can see, now we don't see the login button. Why? That's because we have this special signed out component, which is a super simple way to render specific elements if we are signed out and then render others if we're signed in. So now that we're signed in right above signed out, we can create the signed in component also imported from clerk next.js. And within it, we can render a user button component also imported from clerk next.js. That's going to say after sign out URL is just forward slash. So if we sign out, we want to redirect back home. Now, what will this do? If I save it, 
you immediately get a fully functional profile icon that once you click it, it's going to open up a complete model where you can see and modify your username, email address, connected accounts, and even modify the password and active devices. It's pretty crazy stuff considering that it took us a couple of minutes to set up. Great. Now that we're logged in, we'll also have to do this beautiful mobile menu that's going to show up home, create event, and my profile, or on larger devices, they're all going to show up right here. So let's first implement the mobile nav bar, which is this one right here. And then we're going to do the one for desktop devices. To get started with creating our nav bar, we can create a new component right here within the shared called nav items and .tsx. It's going to be a React arrow function component. And we can use it right here after the user button. So let's simply render the nav items and simply close it like so. Of course, we have to import it from nav items. If we go back, you can see we have nav items here. Or rather, I think I made a mistake. This nav items should be showing on desktop devices. So let's pull it outside of this dev here. Let's create a new signed in component that's going to have a nav within it. And then within that nav, we're going to display the nav items. Now we have two of those, right? Hmm. But let's style our nav a bit more by giving it a class name equal to on medium devices, flex between usually hidden W full and max dash W X S. This is going to hide it on mobile devices, but make it show on larger devices. And now we can create a second component for our mobile nav by going to shared and creating a new mobile nav.tsx component where we can run RAFCE. And instead of rendering the nav items here below, we can render the mobile nav and of course imported from mobile nav as well. Also, I entered a couple of characters here, which we don't need. So if we save it, it's looking good, which means that now we can navigate to the mobile nav and start implementing it. For our mobile nav, we're going to use a ShadCN component called a sheet. You can click open right here and see that it is a modal that opens up on the right side, which is exactly what we need. So to install it, we can just copy this command and paste it in our terminal. MPX ShadCN UI latest add sheet. This is what I have been telling you about. You only add things that you need. In this case, we need a sheet so we can install it. While it's getting installed, let's also import everything we need from a sheet right here at the top. And we can use their demo example of how to use a sheet. But first, let's wrap it in a nav that's going to have a class name equal to on medium devices hidden. And now within it, we can paste the sheet that we copied and indent it properly. Now, if we save it and go back, you can see that we can press open and there we go. It's pretty simple, but it looks a bit off. We're going to fix it up really soon. For now, let's simply modify our trigger to open it up by giving it a class name equal to align dash middle. And then within it, we want to render a Next.js image, which we can import. And it's going to have a source equal to forward slash assets, forward slash icons, forward slash menu dot SVG with an alt tag of menu, a width of about 24 pixels and a height of 24 pixels as well and a class name equal to cursor dash pointer. If we do it, now we have our great mobile menu, which still looks a bit weird, but we're going to fix it. Below this sheet trigger, we have sheet content to which we can provide a class name equal to flex, flex dash call. So the elements show one on top of another, a gap of six between elements, a BG of white, and on medium devices hidden right within there. We don't really need a sheet header so we can remove it, but we do need an image. This image is going to have a source equal to forward slash assets, 
forward slash images forward slash logo dot SVG, an alt tag of logo, a width of 128 and a height of 38. Right below it, we're going to use a component called a separator, which is also coming from ShotCN. So let's search for separator. And you can see it is just a single line. Again, you might be asking yourself, why do I need to import it? But again, it's not adding any additional bloat to your application. It just adds a well-structured line that is immediately responsive. So let's install a separator like we do it usually by running MPX ShotCN UI latest at separator. And we can use it right here below the image. Of course, we have to import it from data slash UI separator, and we can give it a class name of border and border dash gray dash 50 to give it a color. So now if we go back and expand it, you can see that we have a nice looking separator right below the separator. We're going to use a component called nav items, which we have created before, and we can save it here. So now we have the nav items here. And we have a beautiful looking sidebar, which is acting as our mobile nav. And if we go right here, we again see the nav items. So now our next step is to simply develop the nav items component. And it's immediately going to work both on our mobile nav as well as on our desktop nav. So to do that, we can change our nav items to be a UL, an unordered list. We can give it a class name equal to. On medium devices, we're going to have flex between, usually flex. Now, before we continue to style it, let's also add some elements within it. Specifically, we want to loop through all of the LI, which are list items, such as home, about, and contact. But see how many lines this would take if we were to manually type it out. What I prefer in this case is to create a new constants file which is going to allow us to immediately export all of the links. So let's expand our file tree and right here in the root of our directory, create a new folder called constants and right within it, a new file called index.ts. In that same readme where you found assets as well as the styles, you'll be able to find the constants.ts, copy it and paste it here. As you can see, it's nothing special, but just an array that has a couple of objects with a label and a route for each link. So now what we can do in nav items, we can simply open a new dynamic block of code and say header links, which we can import from constants dot map where we get each individual link. And for each link, we're going to open up a function block and then return an LI, a list item. For now we can render a link within that list item. And that link can render a link dot label. But of course, what is a link without an href? href is going to be a link dot route. So now if we save this and open up the mobile nav, you can see home event and my profile. And similarly, you can see that right here on desktop as well. Now let's style them further. Let's give this UL a W dash full. So it takes the full width, a flex dash call, items dash start, gap of five, and then on medium devices, a flex of row. That's going to make it look good right here on our desktop, as well as it will look good on our mobile as well. Let's also figure out which link is currently active by styling our LI. And we can do that by figuring out on which path are we currently on. And for that, we'll have to use the use path name hook by saying const path name is equal to use path name coming from next navigation, which we call as a hook. And then we can say const is active is equal to if link that route is equal to the path name. And we can now use this to style the elements accordingly. Since we're mapping over these allies, let's give them a key equal to link that route. And let's give them a class name here. We can make it a template string where if is active is true. In that case, we want to give it a text dash primary 500. And then we can continue styling it by exiting this block of code 
and saying flex center, P dash medium dash 16, and a white space of no wrap. If we save this, you can see that the use path name can only be used within a client component. So whenever you see this, we have to convert our component to a client component by giving it a use client directive. If you do that, you can notice our home is activated. This looks good. And also on our desktop, our home is activated. With that done, we have created a beautiful looking mobile and desktop navigation, which also includes complete authentication functionality thanks to Clerk. So now we can collapse this, close the nav items, and with that, we're done not only with our header, but with our authentication entirely. We will revisit it soon to sync up the account that Clerk created with our own account in the database, but more on that soon. For now, let's also implement the footer. To do that, we can close this file and navigate to the footer file. The easiest way to navigate files within Visual Studio Code is pressing Control P. And then you can start typing the name of the file and press Enter and boom, you're there. This is the second or third pro tip of the day. If you'd like me to include more of these pro tips, just let me know. With that said, implementing the footer will be straightforward. We're going to return an HTML5 semantic footer tag with a class name equal to border-t for top. Then we're going to wrap everything in a div. Within that div, we're going to have a link that's going to have an href pointing to just forward slash. And of course, once again, we're going to render our image that's going to be our logo. So it's going to have a source equal to forward slash assets, forward slash images, forward slash logo dot SVG. We're going to also give it an alt tag of logo, a width of about 128 and a height of 38 as well. And now if we import image from next image and link from next link, you'll be able to see it right here at the bottom. Right below the link, let's also create a P tag that's going to say 2023 evently all rights reserved. There we go. I think this is looking good. Let's just style it a bit better by giving this div a class name equal to flex dash center wrapper flex dash between make it a flex container and make it flex call. So on smaller devices, the elements appear one below another. Let's also give it a gap of four, a padding of five, text dash center, as well as on small devices, it's going to be flex dash row. So now we have a beautiful looking footer on mobile devices, as well as on desktop. Of course, now you can see two different logos, but as soon as we have the content, you won't be able to see it until you scroll down. So with that said, this is looking great. And finally, we are ready to get started with our main content, which is the content within our page, the home page. So first, we're going to start by creating this beautiful hero section, which looks great on mobile as well as on tablet and desktop devices. And then we're going to take a brief pause from the front end and move to the back end to allow the creation of our events then we'll be able to come back and implement the events on the front end as well. This is a full stack course after all, which means that a lot of exciting stuff is coming. But of course, the hero section first. To implement the hero section, we can wrap everything in an empty React fragment. And then within it, we can create a new section. This section is going to have a class name equal to bg-primary-50. If we save it, and go back, not a lot has changed. Let's also give it a BG dash dotted dash pattern, BG dash contain padding Y of five and on medium devices, padding Y of 10. Now we can start seeing what is yet to become a hero section. Within that section, we can have a div that's going to have a class name equal to wrapper. 
Wrapper simply means that it's going to give it a max width. So if we expand it a lot, it's not going to allow the contents of that wrapper to go any further. We're going to also make this a grid with a grid dash calls dash one and a gap of five. On medium devices, grid dash calls is going to be two and on two extra large gap is going to be zero. Finally, let's start with the hero title by creating a div that's going to have a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, justify dash center, and a gap of eight. Within that div, we can create an H1. That H1 is going to have a class name equal to H1 dash bold. And it's going to say something like it does here, host, connect, and celebrate your events, our platform. The deployed platform is going to be linked to our GitHub repository, so you can find it there and open it up. And I would really appreciate it if you would give it a star. So let's copy the title from here and paste it right here. If we go back, that's already looking much better. Below the H1, let's also create a P tag that's going to have a class name equal to P dash regular dash 20 and on medium devices, P dash regular dash 24. We can go to our deployed site and also copy the content right here and paste it within our P tag. There we go. Now below it, we can also render a button, which we need to import from components UI button. The button is going to wrap a link coming from next link. It's going to have an href pointing to hash events meaning it's going to scroll down a bit and it's going to say explore now. There we go. We can also style it a bit, the button, not the link by giving it a size of LG as child and a class name equal to button W dash full and on small devices W dash fit. There we go. That's more so a button from evently. There we go. That's looking great. Let's go below the div and let's also add a hero image. This image is going to have a source equal to forward slash assets, forward slash images, forward slash hero dot PNG. And of course we have to import image from next image. Then we have to give it an alt tag of hero, a width of about a thousand and a height of about a thousand as well. If we save it, okay, it's looking good already. If we expand it a bit, it's going to show up on the side, but let's also give it a couple more class names, such as a max dash H dash inside of square brackets, 70 VH object dash contain object dash center and on two XL. So on really large devices, a max dash height of 50 VH like this. There we go. So now it looks good on our small mobile devices. If we expand it, it's still looking good. And I just noticed I'm zoomed in. So I want to zoom out just a bit. And if we expand it to the full width, you can see what the wrapper is doing. It aligns it with the nav bar. So now the content looks exactly as it does on the deployed website. Now let's also add this header trusted by thousands of events by going back and moving below the section by creating a new section that's going to have an ID equal to events, a class name equal to wrapper, margin Y of eight, flex, flex dash call, and a gap of eight, and on medium devices, a gap of 12. Within there, we can create a new H2 that's going to have a class name equal to h2 dash bold and it's going to say trusted by we can put a break tag right here in between thousands of events if we save it and scroll down you can see it looks good right below we're going to have a div that's going to have a class name equal to flex w dash full flex dash call a gap of five and on medium devices, a flex of row. 
within there, we're going to display our search and later on our category filter as well. So if I now save this, you'll be able to see search and category filter later on, they're going to look like this much, much better. Right. And then of course, we're going to have events appear at the bottom. And then we have pagination as well. Let's not forget about that and the footer. But now we have reached a specific point in time where we can no longer continue by creating our front end. It's impossible to map over our events if we don't have any. Heck, we don't even have a structure to create those events off of. So now is the perfect time to create the database as well as the backend models that we can then later on create these events off of. Let's do that by putting our browser all the way to the end and starting with the backend. To get started with creating our backend, first, we have to create our Mongoose connection to our MongoDB Atlas database. So to do that, we can collapse all the files and there create a new folder called MongoDB. And then within it, create a new folder called database. Within the database, we can create a new file called index.ts. This is going to be the setup for our database. So let's see how we're going to go about doing this. First, we have to install two packages by running npm install mongoose and mongodb. While they're getting installed, we can already start setting them up. And in this file, I'm going to teach you an incredibly common pattern used in Node.js applications, especially in serverless environments like Vercel. This technique is used to cache a database connection in this case, a MongoDB connection via Mongoose across multiple invocations off serverless API routes in Next.js. So let's write it together step by step. So to get started, let's import Mongoose coming from Mongoose. Then we can say let cached, which is referring to our cached connection, is equal to Mongoose or an object that has the con, as in connection, set to null as well as a promise set to null as well. So this is that if we don't already have a Mongoose cached connection, in that case, we're going to simply set it to an empty object. Then we want to create and export a new function. So we can say export const connect to database, which is going to be equal to an async arrow function. And there we can check if a cached dot connection exists. If so, we can simply exit out of the function and just return the cached connection. It is as simple as that. You can see here it's complaining a bit about the con doesn't exist on type of mongoose. So we can use a little TypeScript trick right here to say global as any dot mongoose. So this way it's going to know that we are referring to the global type of mongoose, not specifically the one we're importing here. At the top, we also want to define the MongoDB URL or the URI, which we want to connect to, which is going to be coming from the MongoDB underscore URI that we need to add to our environment variables. So let's get yours right away. You can head to mongodb.com forward slash Atlas, and then simply sign in or try for free. Now that you're in, you can create a new project. Let's give it a name, something like Evently. Click next and click create project. Now you can go to the project overview or head to database or find more resources here. In this case, we want to go to database and we want to build a database. In this case, we're going to choose M zero free for learning and exploring MongoDB and click create. You'll have to choose your username as well as password and make sure to remember those. I'm going to do JS mastery as well as one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and create a user. We're going to choose our local environment. And I believe that our IP address has already been added. So let's click finish and close. And we can go to overview. There we go. Our database and the cluster are getting set up. And while that's happening, let's go to network access and add IP address. And in this case, we're going to allow access from anywhere and click confirm. This will eliminate any kind of issues or bugs you're experiencing with the database. So you can proceed with building it really easily. With that said, let's go to our overview. 
and let's click connect. There it's going to tell you what you have to do, but the most important thing is this connection string. So let's copy it and let's go to our .env.local and let's create a new variable, which is going to be called mongodb underscore URI. There we go. So now we have our mongodb URI. There we go. And of course, you need to replace this with your actual password. Once you do that, you can go back to our index and you can see that we're already referring to this mongodb URI. So our database setup is done. I'm going to leave this open right here under database because as soon as we add some documents to it, we'll be able to visualize that data right here by going to browse collections. And then here you'll be able to see a data set. For now, let's go back and let's proceed with creating this cache function. So here we want to check if we don't have a MongoDB URI, in which case we can throw a new error saying MongoDB URI is missing. Finally, if we have a cached connection, we want to say cached.promise is equal to cached.promise, or we want to create a new connection by running the mongoose.connect mongodb URI, and we want to pass additional options right here. And those options are going to be db name, which we can call evently, as well as buffer commands is set to false. This is going to disable buffering on all models associated with this connection. And you can read more about buffering right here. Finally, now that we have a cached dot connection, we can say await cached dot promise. And then finally, we return a cached connection. So one more time, let me explain what this does. Here, we initialize a cached variable. So here we attempt to retrieve a mongoose property from the global object. In Node.js, this global object that you can see right here provides a space to store global variables. The cached variable is intent to hold a cached connection to our database. Then we're checking if cached is already connected. This would be the case where our connection runs for the first time. Finally, here we either connect to an already existing cache connection or we create a new connection. Now, why would we want to use this pattern? Well, in serverless functions or environments where your code could be executed multiple times, but not in a single continuous server process, you need to manage database connections efficiently. Because each invocation of a serverless function could result in a new connection to the database. Now, why would we want to use this pattern? Well, in serverless functions and environments where your code could be executed multiple times, but not in a single continuous server process, you need to manage database connections efficiently because each invocation of a serverless function could result in a new connection to the database, which is inefficient and can exhaust database resources. You're going to see really soon why that is the case. We're going to use server actions and each server action will have to call connect to database again and again and again. And if we weren't caching it, it would just be making new connections to the database. But by caching our connection or the promise of a connection, all the subsequent invocations can reuse the existing connection if it's still open or just try to create a new one. It's much more efficient. With that said, now that we have our connection, we can also start creating our models. Specifically, we're going to start with our user model. So let's create a new folder right within our database called models. And we're going to create a first one called user.model.ts. There, we want to define a user schema by saying const user schema is equal to new schema, which we have to import from Mongoose. And then we define it like so by providing it an array of different properties. The first thing it's going to have is the clerk ID. This is going to help us make a connection between a clerk user and our database user. It's going to be of a type string. It will be required, of course. And it also has to be unique. So there we go. Now, after the clerk ID, we want to have an email. An email is going to also be of a type string, 
also required to true and unique to true. By the way, if you're wondering what does this autofill for me, which is pretty crazy, it's GitHub Copilot. I've been using it more and more lately and in no way am I related to them, but I gotta say it's a pretty useful tool to use. Apparently it increases your developer efficiency by 55% and the price is, I believe about 10 bucks per month for a license. So it's a pretty good deal. I use it in my everyday workflow. I wanna ask, is it a bit distracting whenever it autofills something for me or is it good to see upfront what's gonna happen? You can let me know down in the comments. Next thing we're gonna have is a username of type string and required to true, and it's also going to be unique. After that, we have to have the first name, which is going to be type string, and we're gonna also make it required to true. Then we wanna have a last name, also type string and required to true, and finally a photo of a type string and required to true. Then we wanna use the schema to create a model by saying const user is equal to, we either get the already existing model by saying models.user, and we have to import those models coming from mongoose, or we create a new model by using a schema. So saying user is gonna be based off of the user schema. And again, we have to import the model as well from mongoose. Next, we export default the user model. Great. Now that we have the model for our user, let's also create a model for our event. We can do that by going to our models and creating a new event.model.ts. We want to do a similar thing here. Const event schema is equal to a new schema where we can pass in the properties we want this document to have. It's going to have a title of a type string as well as a required to true. And of course, we have to import the schema from Mongoose. Then we're gonna also give it a description, type string, but we won't make it required. Let's also have a location, which is going to be of a type string. We also don't have to make it required. Then we can have a created add property, which is going to be of a type date and default at date.now. Every event is also going to have an image URL which is going to be equal to a type string and required to true. Then we have to know the start and the end date of each event. So we can say the start date is type date required to true. And specifically we can say start date time and we can do the same thing for end date time, which is going to be date.now by default. So we can change the defaults for both of these to date.now. Each event can also have a price, which is going to be of a type string, because it's gonna be a dollar amount. We're gonna also have the is free in case there's no price, which is going to be of a type Boolean default to false. Each event can have a URL, which is going to be a type of string. And it's also going to have a category, which is going to be a connection to another model in our database. So we can say type is equal to schema, which we have to import from mongoose dot types dot object ID, but with a reference to a category model. And we want to do the similar thing for the organizer. So organizer is also going to be a reference to another model, but in this case to the user model that created it. Finally, we can create a model based off of the schema by saying const event is equal to models dot event or model where we create a new instance of that model based off of the event schema. Finally, we have to export default.model or event. And of course we have to import the models from mongoose as well as the model. Now across our entire application, we always wanna know which properties does this model have or all of the documents of that model. And for that, TypeScript comes to rescue. What we can do right now is we can export interface called iEvent, which extends the document, which is coming from Mongoose. And then here we can define all of the properties that it's going to have 
so that within our front-end application, we know exactly which properties each document in our database has. Now, I think this is the perfect use case for ChatGPT because we already have our schema and we wanna create types based off of that schema. So I pulled up my ChatGPT right here. I'm gonna copy this schema as well as the interface, paste it and say, fill in the I event interface based off of the event schema. And let's see how well it will do it. There we go, it matched the properties. Let's go ahead and copy it and paste it right here. Now we always have to be careful and give it another look to ensure that everything is done correctly. First, I noticed that we missed the underscore ID property, which is automatically there created by Mongoose. Then we have a title, we have a description, we have a location, created at, image URL, start date, end date, price is free, URL. And then we have a category, which can be object ID or string. But in this case, I'm gonna actually turn it into an object and say that it's going to have an underscore ID of a type string and a name equal to string as well. We wanna do a similar thing with the organizer, but it's going to have the underscore ID of a type string, a first name of a type string, as well as the last name of a type string as well. And now we also have this type or interface, which we can use across our application to know exactly which properties our model has. Great, so now we have created a model as well as a connection to our database. So let's actually create a function that's going to connect us to the database and then create a user or an event or anything really. Let's start with users because just creating a clerk user is not enough. We have to figure out a way to create a database user as soon as the clerk user is created. And we can do that using a concept known as webhooks. So what is a webhook? Well, a webhook is an event trigger. So when something happens, trigger something and make a request and then process that event. Webhooks is a general term used in web development as well as other applications. So in this case, we'll be creating a webhook as soon as the clerk account is created and using the concept of webhooks, we're going to sync our clerk data to our backend. So let's go ahead and follow this documentation page by clerk. First on our dashboard, we need to enable webhooks. So let's go here, go to webhooks, and then add an endpoint. Now let's figure out what do we have to add here. It's going to give us some information. Then we have to add our sign-in secret to our .env local, like this. And then we need to understand how does it work. Install the Svix package because it's going to verify the webhook signature, making sure that it's authentic. And then we can create the endpoint in our application. So let's take it step by step. Now, in our case, we're gonna skip the step one for now and get back to it later on, because for it, we have to have our deployed version of our application. You can do it on localhost as well, but then we'll have to set up an ng rock server and that can add to the complexity. The simplest solution is to just get it deployed and then enter the deployed webhook endpoint. The second step is to add our signing secret to the .env.local. Once again, we're gonna do that later once we deploy it. But now we have to understand the webhook payload. Clerk webhook events are sent as HTTP POST requests with a JSON body. It has data, object, and type. More on that really soon. For now, let's simply install the Swix package. We can do that by running npm install Swix. And then we have to create the endpoint in our application by doing it within the app API webhook route.ts. So let's copy this entire file. It's within clerk.com docs users sync dash data. And then we're gonna go to app. As we learned, it's going to be API webhook route.ts. So let's create a new folder called API webhook. And then we're gonna add a new folder within webhook called clerk and within it, a new route.ts. And there we can paste everything we copied. 
This right here is just Svix setup, so nothing major here. We have the webhook secret and so on, but the most important part happens right here after line 50. Get the ID and the type. So here we can trigger specific actions happening based off of specific events and triggers. So in this case, we want to do something whenever a user is created. So we can say if event type is triple equal to user dot created. In that case, we can pull all the data from that user by saying const ID email underscore addresses image URL first underscore name last underscore name and username. We want to pull all of that data from evt as an event dot data. Then we want to form our new user by saying const user is equal to an object where the clerk ID is set to ID. The email is set to email addresses zero dot email address. Username is set to username. First name is set to first underscore name. Last name is set to last underscore name. And then a photo is set to image underscore URL. Now that we have all of that data, we need to create a new database user. So we can say const new user is equal to await create user and pass that entire user right in. Of course, you're going to notice that this create user function doesn't yet exist. So let's comment it out for now. And let's create this create user action, which is going to be our first database action of the day. So let's go right here to our lib and create a new actions folder right next to the database folder. And there create a new file called user.actions.ts. This file is going to be a Next.js server action file, which means that we have to use the use server directive. That means that this code will be run on the server. Here, we can create and export a new function called create user, which is equal to an async arrow function that accepts user data as a parameter. And then it tries to create that user in the database. Now we have to define a type for the data we're passing right in here. And we can do that if we go to our new folder in the root of our directory called types. And there we can create a new index.ts file. I will provide this file for you in the same readme that you visited before. Copy it and simply paste it here. Here we have some predefined types which we can use in our application. Specifically, we're going to use the create user params first. And this is a type that has all the properties that we're passing from our webhook. It has a clerk ID, first name, last name, username, email, and photo. And if you remember what we did in our webhook, you can see that those are the same things we're passing right here. So this is just for us to know what should we be getting. So with that said, we can go back here and define a new create user params and then import them from types. Now, if we try to say something like user dot test, we can immediately notice that test doesn't exist on type create user params. While at the same time, if we try to do user dot username, we can know that it exists and that it's of a type string. TypeScript is pretty cool. With that said, we can create a new try and catch block. And let's first handle the errors. We're going to create a custom error handling function. It's going to be contained within a new file called utils. We can see it right here, utils.ts. This utility function was created automatically for us by ChatCN, but we want to add many more utility functions. So right below the types in that same readme, you'll be able to find the utils.ts as well. So simply copy it and paste it right here. Here, we're going to have some utility functions that remove keys from queries, as well as add URL query params, formatting the price, and so on. The reason why I don't want to go into too much detail about these functions is that most of them, if not all, have been generated by ChatGPT. 
Nowadays, whenever you need to convert some files to URLs, format the prices, or remove some keys from query URL, you can do all of that by simply using ChatGPT. And here is our handle error function that we talked about. It accepts an error, Kanza logs it, and then simply throws out a new error. That's it. So now we can go back to user action and we can call the handle error imported from utils to which we can pass the error. And if you notice correctly in our utils file, we have this query string, which is a package we have to install. So let's open up our terminal and run npm install query dash string. As soon as it gets installed, you can see that the warning is gone. Great. Now let's go to the most important detail about this function. And that is that we have to try to connect to our database. So a key differentiation here is that we don't have a server that is always running. Our actions are going to run only once we call them. This Vercel document nicely explains serverless concept. Essentially, Vercel serverless functions enable running code on demand without needing to manage your own infrastructure. Essentially, whenever you do something in the browser, you're going to trigger a new function on the server. It looks something like this. We're going to have a function to create a user, update a user, and so on. And whenever you do something, they're going to be called on the server without needing to run the server at all times. So that means that we have to run the await connect to database function each time. Remember, this is the function that we created not that long ago, which tries to find the cached connection. So that's why it's so important. We'll be calling this a lot. And we don't need to connect to database every time if we already have a cached connection. Now, what are we going to try to do once we connect to our database? Well, in this case, we simply want to create a new user by saying const new user is equal to await user.create to which we pass the user data. Then we want to return the json.parse and then json.stringify of that new user. So this is the actual data that we pass to the front end. The reason why we're doing this is to just get a general JavaScript object of the user, not necessarily a MongoDB document. And we also have to import the user from database models user model. Great. With that said, we have successfully created our first server action that creates a user. Now we can call this right within our webhook, right here where we left off by saying const new user is a way to create user, which we import from lib actions user action. And you can notice it's complaining a bit saying that the user is not good. It's saying that the types of property username are incompatible. It could be a string or it could be a null. So here we can specify an exclamation mark saying that the username can sometimes be a null. Now, once we do have this new user, so if new user exists, then we want to await clerk client dot users dot update user metadata based off of the user ID, we want to pass the public metadata. And we want to connect the user ID to be equal to the new user dot underscore ID. And this clerk client, of course, has to be imported from add clerk forward slash nextjs. Now, let me explain what we did here. You know how when we created a model of a user in the database, we specified a clerk ID here. That's so we can make a clerk connection to our database connection. But at the same time here, we're making a database connection to our clerk model by defining the user ID and passing it over as public metadata to our clerk user. That way we always know what they're working with. Finally, we want to go down and return a next response dot json with a message of OK and a user equal to new user. And this is one of our webhook events where we create a new user in the database as soon as the new clerk user is created. Now we also want to repeat this whenever a user gets updated or deleted too. So just so we don't have to type everything manually as it's basically the same, the code for the update and delete is in the readme down below. First, you have to do the webhook part, 
where we simply do the same thing, just call the user update and call the update user action and then pass the next response. And then we want to do the similar thing for the user delete. As you can see right here, we just get the event and it's even simpler. We just call the delete user action and then say user deleted. Now you can see we have to import this next response coming from next server. So we can do that. And we also have to import those two user actions, the update user and delete user. So in the same way that I provided you these webhook events, I'm going to provide you the full finished user actions TS file, which you can find in the readme and then override right here. It's going to have the function to delete the user. And at the same time, when we delete a user, we also have to delete all the events as well as all the orders that that user had. And then finally, we're also doing the same thing for the update user, where we simply call user that find one and update and then update it. We also have the get user by ID, which we're going to use later on. And then the function we have created before, which is the create user. Now you can notice that already we need access to the user order event and all the other models that we have. So let's go ahead and create those models as well. We can do that by going to our database models and then creating a new category dot model dot TS inside of which we can create those models by saying const category schema this time is equal to a new schema where we simply have a name that's going to be of a type string, a required to true, as well as a unique to true. So we can have more categories. Of course, we have to import schema coming from mongoose and this string has a capital S. Once we create it, we can also create a corresponding type by saying export interface, I category extends document which is coming from mongoose. It's going to have an underscore ID of a type string as well as a name of a type string. Then we have to turn this schema into a model by saying const category is equal to models that category with a capital C or model of a name category based off of the category schema. Finally, we can export default category. And we need to import the models from mongoose as well as the model from mongoose as well. Now we can duplicate this entire file and create the last model of our application, which is the order.model.ts. The order is going to be similar to all of our other schemas. So in the readme down below, you can copy it and just paste it right here. You can see we're doing the same thing and we're defining properties like created add. We're connecting the Stripe ID to it, the amount, the event that we're buying, and then who bought it. We're also defining the types for that interface at the top. Now, I want to ask you an important question here. I did give you some code to copy right here, but that's only because I don't think this code is crucial for the learning of this project. And it's mostly repeating the stuff we have already done, but it's necessary for the build of our application. So please let me know if you don't like me doing this, providing the code, and you would like to do absolutely everything on your own, or if you're happy that I provide some pieces to speed up the process and make your learning more efficient. I would really appreciate your feedback on this in the comments. So feel free to pause the video and let me know. With that done, we can now go back to our user actions. And you can notice that now we have the connect database coming from lib database, and we have all of the other models coming from database models and then their corresponding files. We also have get user by ID, create user, update user, and delete user. So now let's close all of the files that we have and let's go back to where we were, which is the webhook. Now going back down, we have user created, which we have created on our own the user updated, which is now using this update user action, which we have to import, as well as the user deleted, for which we also have to import this delete action. That said, now our clerk instance is going to call our events on specific triggers, which means that our creation, deletion, or the update process of our clerk users is going to be neatly tied 
with the creation, deletion, and the update process of the users in our database as well. But before that can happen, we need to actually create a new endpoint within Clerk, and we can only do that if our app is deployed. So now would be a perfect time to already, believe it or not, get our app deployed to Vercel so we can check it out live. And as a matter of fact, this is another pro tip, and that is to deploy your application as soon as possible and then use the continuous updates and deployments that Vercel provides right off the bat to check how your app looks and feels on deployment as well. The process of doing that is pretty simple. And it starts with pushing your code to GitHub. You can head to github.com forward slash new and create a new repository. Let's call it event platform. I'm going to make it public and I'm going to click create repository. As soon as you do that, you can head to Vercel. As you can see, I have a lot of Vercel projects here. We are running our own course platform on Vercel. And we also have a lot of different projects for all of our cohorts of the JSM masterclass experience. If you're not sure about what that is, first of all, this application is being deployed to Vercel, which is our own landing page where we have everything about our courses. And if you're watching this video, I think you would love what we offer in the next JS 14 ultimate course. And then of course, there's the masterclass, which is our own bootcamp program, a lot of exciting stuff, but without talking about it too much, let's create a new project. And immediately you should be able to see it at the top. If you head to your own profile, there we go. A minute ago, event platform. So let's import it. The framework is going to be Next.js, of course. The root directory is the dot slash. And we want to choose the environment variables. So you can go right here to our dot env dot local, select everything, and simply paste it right here under the first key. It's going to automatically populate it. And before we deploy it, we of course have to push all the code to GitHub. So right now it's just an empty repo. So Let's go ahead and open up our terminal and run git init, git add dot, git commit dash m first commit. And then we want to copy the rest of the commands from here. Git branch dash m main, git remote add origin. And finally, git push u origin master, or in this case, main. Now, as soon as you reload your GitHub page, you'll be able to see your code right here. And if we click deploy, you're going to see an error. I made a mistake. I should have pushed the code before we started to configure this project. So let's go back and you'll be able to see a new event platform appear right here. But this time it immediately knows that it's Next.js. Reload if it's not appearing and then click import. Now immediately it has Next.js and we can just re-add our environment variables and click deploy. There we go. The deployment process started. It usually takes about a minute, so let's give it some time and I'll be right back. And in not more than a minute, we see a congratulations and we can see our platform right here. Let's click it to open it up. And there we go. Our event platform is live on Vercel. This is great. You can click continue to dashboard. We're going to use this later on to track all of our commits and deployments and builds. But what this now just did is it exposed our API route. So first of all, it of course exposed our general page right here to the internet, but it also did the same thing with the API webhook clerk route. So now we can add it as an endpoint to clerk. Let's go right here and let's add an endpoint in this case. It's going to be this URL of our application, then forward slash API, forward slash webhook, forward slash clerk. And we want to turn on specific events, specifically once regarding to the user. So we can select user created, deleted, and updated, and created. There we go. Also, don't forget the sign in secret. You can click it right here, copy it. And as the clerk doc said, if we scroll a bit down, that is that we have to add our webhook secret. So right here on our local environment, we can go to .env.local and add 
webhook secret. Like this, and paste our secret. But don't forget, we also have to add it to our deployed application. So go back to Vercel, go to settings, environment variables, paste it right here and press save. Then go to deployments. And this is another pro tip of the day. You have to redeploy your application whenever you change environment variables. So just click redeploy and redeploy once again. This means that in about a minute, our new application with the endpoint attached to the clerk webhook is gonna be live. So let's wait a minute until it builds. And once it is ready, we can go back to our clerk dashboard, go to users, and I wanna delete our existing user because we created this user before we hooked it up to our database. So we can delete it. We can clean our browser just a bit by closing all the files which we don't need, which is this chat CN page, chat GPT, a couple of our cell pages, and so on. What we need is our clerk dashboard as well as our database dashboard so we can see whether our users are actually getting created on both the platforms. So now we can go to our local application and we can click login. Then you can sign in or sign up, enter your username, I'm gonna choose the real JSM and press continue. As you can see, we're now logged in, but that used to work before, right? It's not a big deal that we have a user here on Clerk. It took us seven minutes to set that up, but it did took us a couple more to hook it up to our database. So now if we go to our database and we go to users, as you can see, this is the part we've been working on. We have our own database instance of this user with a photo directly from clerk, first name, last name, username, all the great things. But we also have a user object ID as well as a clerk ID. So it knows which user is referring to. And at the same time, our user right here, if we click into it, has a metadata object of a user ID which corresponds to the user ID of our database right here. Now, with that said, I'm gonna close Clerk and I'm gonna pin our MongoDB right here at the start so we can always revisit it and see how our event creation process is going on. I'm also gonna pin our deployed application just so we have the local host very nicely exposed here and we can collapse it to our mobile view. With that said, we are ready to proceed with our application all the way where we left off and that is creating the events. Because without events, there's nothing to show on the homepage. So what do you say that we focus on another part of our platform, which is the front-end interface for creating the event? And then once we do that, we can start focusing on the action for creating the events on our backend. So let's start replicating this by going to our app, root, and creating a new folder called events. And then within events, a new folder called create. Within create, we can create a new page.tsx that's going to run RAFCE. And we can call it create event. Now, if we save this, we have to somehow redirect to this. And I believe we're already doing that from our sidebar. If we click create event, you can see a new page that says create event showed up which means that we are in the right place. So let's get started. To get started with our create event page, let's first wrap it into a section. This section is going to have an H3 within it that's going to say create event. We can give it a class name equal to wrapper, h3-bold, text-center, as well as on small devices, text-left. If we save it, that's gonna look a bit better. Let's also give a class name to this section, such as bg-primary-50, bg-dotted-pattern, bg-cover, bg-center, padding y off five, and on medium devices, padding y off 10. There we go, that's better. Now, right below this entire section, we can create a new div, it's going to have a class name 
equal to wrapper and margin y of eight. Of course, if we have adjacent elements, we have to wrap them in an empty React fragment, just like so. And within this div, we're gonna render an entire reusable event form. So let's go to components and let's create a new component within the shared folder called event form dot TSX. The reason why we're doing this and we're gonna run REFCE here is because this event form is gonna be handling keyboard, mouse, and all sorts of different events. So we have to turn it into a use client component, whereas our page is going to remain rendered on the server side. But that's not the only reason. Let me first render it, and then I'm gonna tell you what I mean. We're gonna render this event form that we created right here by importing it from components shared. We're gonna also pass it two different things. First, we're gonna pass it the ID of the user that's currently interacting with the form. And Clerk makes it so easy. The only thing we have to do is say const session claims is equal to auth, a hook call which you can import from Clerk Next.js. Then we can extract the user ID by saying const user ID is equal to session claims dot user ID as string. And also we can add a question mark in case a session claim don't exist. Then we can simply pass the user ID is equal to the user ID to the form, as well as pass a special type of create. More on that soon. Now you can see that our event form is complaining that it's not anticipating us to pass the user ID. So let's go into the event form and let's specify which props do we want to receive. Here, we can say that we want to get a user ID and a type. And we can define that as a type of event form props. So let's define the type event form props is equal to where the user ID is of a type string and the type is equal to either create or let's call it update. I think you can see where I'm going with this. If we're calling the form from the create page, we're gonna render the event form, but let's render the type of the form as create. So event form create. But at the same time, we can reuse this entire page, that is the page create events by copying it and creating a new page. This time it's going to be within events and we wanna create a new special route called square brackets ID. So this is going to be on the ID of a specific page. And then within it, a new folder called update. And within update, we want to add the page.tsx inside of which we can paste what we copied. This time it's not gonna be create, but rather it's going to be update event. Here we can say update event as well. And instead of type create, we're gonna pass the type of update. So let me show you what I mean here. We have this form on the create on the finished website. Looks great, right? But it's empty. But we're immediately creating it in a way that's gonna make it reusable later on. So now if we go to a specific event that we created, you would be able to just click it, click edit, and it's going to open up the same form that we have here, but with all of the data already pre-populated. So with that said, creating the actual create event page wasn't that hard or the update event for that matter, but what's gonna be harder is developing this event form component, which is going to handle all of the logic required for us to actually create the event. So let's get started. Our event form is going to be by far the most complex component of this entire application. But don't let that scare you because we're going to approach it step by step. We're gonna start by using a form made by Shatzien that utilizes React hook form and Zod. And I wanna read this paragraph out to you. Forms are tricky. They are one of the most common things you'll build in a web application but also one of the most complex. Well-designed forms are well-structured, easy to use, accessible, 
and have support for client and server-side validation, and they're well-styled and consistent with the rest of the application. So together, we're going to look at building forms with React Hook Form and Zod. We're going to use a form field component to compose accessible forms using Radix UI components. So first of all, we'll have to wrap everything with a form. That will allow us to use different form fields and then also handle validation. This is how it's going to look like. Here, we have a form with a form field, and that form field has a form item with a form label and a form control, description, and everything else you need to pass to your form item. Here is a real example where we define a form, and then, for example, this is a form for the username. We have an input, and we pass all the fields related to that input. Now, let's take it step by step, and as I told you, I don't want to teach you how to do this just this one time. I want to teach you how to do it every time in the future by properly following the documentation. So let's get started by installing our form. We can open up our terminal and paste the mpx UI at latest add form. While that is happening, we can start to define the form. First, we have to use the use form hook from React hook form. So let's copy these two lines. That's going to be import Zod resolver as well as the use form. And also we need to get everything as Z from Zod as well as the form schema. That's gonna look like this. Then we need to define our form right within our form component. So let's copy this form alongside the onSubmit function. We can do that right here on top of our return. There we go. Now, since form field is a controlled component, you need to provide a default value for the field. And we're doing that right here. Now we can use all of the form components to actually create the presentation of our form. So let's import the button, the form control, form, the input as well. And let's paste it right here at the top. As you can see, we also need to install our input. So we can say mpx shadcn UI add latest add input because an input is a part of the form. Then we already added the validation and we can copy the actual form itself. And then we can paste it right here to override this div. Now, if we save this, we should have everything we need to form a simple form. So if we go back right here and reload the page, you can see that we have a label, we have the placeholder and then the input itself with some additional information and the submit button. Also, we have built-in validation. So if we just click submit, you can notice that it goes red and it says username must be at least two characters. Now, with that said, we need to go from this to this. And we're gonna do that step-by-step step now that we know how our form is going to look like. What I usually like to do with these imports is just have them all in one line as we don't really have to read them often. We have an input, and also, since our form is going to be bigger, I'm going to move validation over to a different file. We're going to go below to the lib folder. And then we want to create a new file within the lib folder called validator.ts. Within the validator, for now, we can simply move over the form schema and then paste it over here. Of course, that will temporarily break our form, but we're going to recover from that really soon. We can also move the import everything as Z from Zod right here. And we have to export it by saying export const, and we're going to call it event form schema. There we go. Now we won't have the username as we already know who our user is, but we will have the title and we can say title is Z dot string. So it has to be a string. It has to have a minimum of three characters. And as the second parameter of the min function, you can provide the actual error message. So we can say title must be at least three characters. There we go. Now we can do a similar thing for the description by adding a comma and duplicating it. We can say description is going to be also a Z dot string with a minimum of three characters. So we can say description must be at least three characters, but we can also chain a dot max to it and say max 400 
and say description must be less than 400 characters. Now let's do a similar thing for location. So we need a location that's going to be a Z that string of minimum three characters. And we can also add a max of 400 by saying dot max 400 location must be less than 400 characters. We have the image URL, which is of a type Z dot string. If you want, you can also make it a URL because it has to be a URL. In this case, I won't add it. We can also add a start date time, which is going to be of a type Z dot date like this. We can also do end date time, which is going to be Z dot date. We need to do a category ID, which is of a type Z dot string. We also need to do a price of Z dot string. We need to add a is free, which is going to be of Z dot Boolean, and then a URL, which is going to be of Z dot. I believe they have a URL, so Z dot URL, or maybe not. Let's do a Z dot string instead. Yeah, but a string, you can change the URL on it. So that can be a string of a URL. There we go. So now this is looking good to me. And now we know exactly what our form has to have. Otherwise, we're going to show specific error messages. So let's go back and let's import this form schema. Or rather, we're calling it event form schema, which we can import from lib validator. And we can use it here and here in three different places. And I noticed that we also have to have Z right here imported. So let's also import everything as Z from Zod. That's going to be like this, import everything as Z from Zod. And we're back where we started. But now the validation is not going to work for username because we don't have the username. So instead, let's add the default values for all of the other fields. The way we're going to do that is right here. At the top, we're going to say const initial values, which is going to be equal to an object. Now, these initial values are going to be all of the values we have declared, but set to their default values, such as an empty string. So in this case, thankfully, we already have that under event default values coming from constants. So make sure to import them. If you click it, you're going to notice that here I have already created an object with all of these default values. So now we can set the default values to be equal to initial values. And now that we have the bare bones of the functionality of our form set up, we can start creating the input fields. So let's start by going into the form and let's give this form, the inner one, a class name of flex, flex dash call and a gap of five to create some spacing between the elements. Right within the form, we're going to create a new div. This div is going to have a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, a gap of five, and then on medium devices, flex of row. And within it, we want to put this existing form field that we have here, and then indent it properly. Now, this will be a form field with a control of form control, but the name is going to be title instead of username. It will have a form item, but the form item is going to have a class name equal to w dash full. And then we don't need a label in this case, but we will have the form control with an input that's going to have a placeholder of event title. We're going to spread the field and we're going to also add a class name equal to input dash field. Now, if we save this, you can see that it looks a bit different and we don't need a form description, but we will keep the form message. And this is our first field. If I reload, you can see the error is gone and we're starting to create something that resembles this. Of course, we have only done the first input, but soon enough, we're going to do the others as well. Now it's just a matter of duplicating these inputs below and then changing them to fit their need. So let's copy this form field and duplicate it below still within this div. The second input is going to have the name of category ID. Now, instead of this input right here, we want to use a drop down, and that's going to be a shared component, which we are about to create. So let's go to Explorer shared and create a new component called dropdown.tsx. 
You can run RAFCE right within it. And then you can import it right here. It's going to be drop down coming from dot slash drop down. We're going to pass some props to it, such as the on change handler. So let's do that on change handler is equal to field dot on change. And we're going to also pass the value equal to field dot value. There we go. So now if we save this and go back, you can see a drop down. So now it's up to us to go into that drop down and start implementing it. First of all, we can accept those props from here, value and the on change handler. These are going to be of a type drop down props. So let's define that type above by saying type drop down props has a value of string, which is going to be optional, as well as the on change handler, which we can leave as optional with simply a function that returns nothing like this. Then within it, we're going to create a new select element. So if we go over to chat CN and search for select, you can see how that's going to look like. And we can slowly start installing it. We can do that by going all the way up and copying this command and then pasting it right here. MPX chat CN UI add latest add select. While it's getting installed, we can copy all the imports, paste them here, and then copy how the select should look like. We can paste it right here. We can indent it properly. Our select is going to receive an on value change equal to on change handler, as well as the value or the default value rather equal to value that we pass from props. Then we have a select trigger that's going to have a class name of select dash field, as well as a select value with a placeholder equal to category. Now, if we go back, you can see that we have this great looking category. And instead of these predefined categories, we can create our own. So we can go within the select content and we want to map over our own categories but we don't have them yet. The thing is, we'll be creating categories dynamically. So for now, the only thing we can do is just create a new use state. Of course, we have to import use state from react. The default value is just going to be an empty array of a type I category, or specifically an array of those categories like this, which we have to import from lib database models. And of course, this is going to be called categories and set categories. So it's possible for users to select one of the predefined categories, or they can create their own if they click add a new category. That's really cool. It's an additional functionality that you learn how to implement. So here we have some predefined ones, but instead of just displaying them here, we can map over our categories coming from state by saying, categories dot length. If it's greater than zero, then we can return categories dot map, where we get each individual category. And for each one, we return a select item. That select item is going to render the category dot name. And of course, since we're mapping over it, it has to have a key equal to category dot underscore ID. And also we need to import this select item. That's good. We're importing it, but we need to give it a value as well. So the second thing we can pass is a value equal to category dot underscore ID, as well as a class name equal to select dash item P dash regular dash 14. So now if we save this, it's not going to work because we don't have any categories, but if I were to add an object here, that's going to have an underscore ID of let's say one and a name equal to category one. You can see that now it appears. We can also replicate it by adding a few more category two and ID of two. And you get the idea later on, we'll add the functionality to add more categories for each of our events. So let's do that right away. 
let's create an alert dialog that's going to pop up and allow us to add a new category once we want to do that. For that, we're going to use a dialog. We can search for it, alert dialog specifically. So let's install this component. You already know the drill. Paste it here. Import all of the imports or just copy all of the imports. And then we can just copy the dialog and paste it right here below the select item, but still within the select content. And we can indent it properly. Now, TypeScript is still complaining about these two fake ones. So I'm going to simply remove them because later on, we're going to have more full objects of categories here. But what we want to focus on is seeing this alert dialog right here. If we go here, we can see open. And yes, it kind of works, but let's modify the styles. We can do that by first adding a class name to this alert dialog trigger. We can give it a class name of p-medium-14, a flex w-full rounded-sm, padding y off 3, and padding l off left. If I save it, you can see it looks a bit different. Let's also give it some color by giving it a text-primary-500. On hover, we can also give it a BG primary of 50. And on focus, we can give it a text dash primary of 500. Now, if I save this, that's looking a bit better. Now let's dive into the alert dialogue content by giving it a class name equal to BG dash white and open it. There we go. That's already much better. Now we can go into the alert dialog header and change the title to new category. There we go. And we can also modify the description by removing everything we have in there and simply rendering a ShadCN input, which of course we have to import from data slash UI input. We can give it a type of text, a placeholder equal to category name, a class name equal to input dash field and margin top of three. And on change, we want to give it where we update the event to set new category and to it, we pass the event dot target dot value. And of course we have to create this new state right here at the top by saying use state snippet. We're going to call it new category and set new category at the start equal to an empty string. Now, if we go down, we have completed the description and then we have the alert dialog footer where we have the cancel. And instead of continue, we can add an on click that's going to call a callback function and it's going to call the start transition function to which we pass the handle add category. This is a function which will we create that will actually add a category to the database and we can say add. So now let's create this function really quickly. We can call it const handle add category. And if we save it, you can see that if we open it, this looks great and we can actually add it. That's great. Later on, we're going to add all the functionality for the dropdown, but for now, I'm happy with how this looks like. I want to take a moment to go back to the event form and continue adding all of the other fields before we completely finalize the category filter. Next is the description and then quite an exciting image upload. We have location, dates, prices, and more. So now let's go below this div in the event form and let's create a new div. This one will have a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, gap of five, and on medium devices, flex of row. We want to copy the first input we had, the first form field, and once again, paste it in this div. In this case, the name is not going to be title, but it's going to be description. The form item is still W full. The input this time is going to be a text area. And that's yet another 
component coming from chat.cn. So we have to install the text area by copying this command and pasting it here. npx chat.cn UI add latest add text area. And this one is much, much simpler. You simply copy the import, paste it at the top, and then use it just as a simple text area component. As a matter of fact, let's replace this input with a text area. The placeholder is going to be description. We're going to spread the field. We're going to give it a class name of text area and a rounded of dash to Excel. If I save this and go back, this is looking good. We can also give this form control a class name of h-72 so that people know they can add a bit of a longer description. Now let's duplicate this form field one more time below. The next one is going to be for the image. So we can say image URL. It's going to be a form item that's going to render the form control. But this time, instead of a text area or an input, we're going to have something known as a file uploader. And this will be yet another component that we will create. So let's create a new shared component called file uploader .tsx, run RAFCE. And then back in here, we can just use that component file uploader coming from dot slash file uploader. And we also need to define one new state. This state is going to be called, of course, use state snippet. It's going to be called files and set files like this at the start equal to an empty array. And we can define a type of file array. And of course, we have to import use state from React. Now that we have this, if we go down, we're going to pass the on field change equal to field that on change. We're going to pass the image URL equal to field that value. And we're going to pass set files is equal to set files. And now we can go back to our file uploader and we can accept all of those props. So that's going to be the image URL, the on field change, as well as the set files, which is going to be of a type file uploader props. So let's define it at the top by saying type file upload props. And we can define the image URL as a string, the on field change as a function where we get the value of type string and return void and set files, which is going to be a dispatch. That's interesting coming from react of a type set state action that's going to take in a file and modify it. So now we're being really precise. All of these are coming from react. And now it's the time that we implement our file uploader. And the star of the show here will be upload thing. Upload thing is the easiest way to implement file upload within your Next.js applications. So head to uploadthing.com, click get started. As you can see, I already have a couple of apps. Click create a new app, enter your app name, and the app URL is optional. Within here, we can learn how to implement it. Let's start with the getting started guide by clicking the read more. Here, we can choose how we manage file hosting. It's going to be like an AWS S3 bucket, but simpler. You'll be able to authorize on your server and you'll be able to give clients a great experience. Let's see if we have a simple getting started guide. I think this is more or less it. It tells you everything you need to know to get started. But let's try to find a bit more information about how to install it. There we go. This was just the introduction. We want to move to the getting started of the Next.js app directory. So first, we have to install upload thing and add upload thing react, which I believe we did at the start. Then we have to add our environment variables. So let's copy this upload thing secret, add it to our env.local. And we can go to our dashboard by opening it in a new tab, going to evently, going to API keys, and then simply copying both variables from here and pasting them here. There we go. That's looking good to me. What else do we have to do? And then they give us everything we need. 
So first of all, we have to set up a file router. All files uploaded to upload thing are associated with a file router. So we have to add that within the API. App API upload thing core.ts. So let's copy this file and then go to app API, create a new folder called upload thing. And within it, create a new file called core.ts and paste what we copied. This is some boilerplate code needed to enable our application. Then we also have create a Next.js API route using the file router. So we can copy this and create another file right next to this one called route.ts and paste what we copied. See, it's not only me providing you some files to copy, it's also the documentations. Sometimes you just have to have some things in there to make things work. Great. So this is looking good to me. We also have to add upload things styles with Tailwind. We have already done that at the start. And then we have to create the upload thing components. That's going to be in source utils upload thing .ts. So let's copy the code, go to our lib utils, or rather just next to utils, we're going to create a new upload thing .ts and paste it. We'll need to set up our path pointing to add forward slash app API upload thing core and leave this file as it is. Finally, we need to mount a button and upload it. That's the last step. But instead of a button, we'll use something more interesting, which is a used drop zone, which means that we'll be able to just drag and drop files seamlessly. So let's search for use drop zone. There we go. And here you can see the API reference or for next maybe. No, under next, we don't have the drop zone, but under react, if we search for drop zone, we have it here. And we also have the upload drop zone right here. This is the upload drop zone. We want to use the use drop zone instead. And here we can see how that works. So what I want to do here is I almost want to copy this entire thing. So let me just do that and then go back to our file uploader, which looks like this. And I'm going to paste it right here above the file uploader. Now we have to be careful. We have to rename this over to the file uploader. So let's just copy this line, which is defining the props we pass into it and delete everything else. And then rename this component to const file uploader. And then everything looks good, but the state is going to be coming through props. So we don't have to define it here. There we go. And also this is an at sign here. Also the path is not correct. It's going to be under, let's see where. That's going to be use upload thing. It's going to be in the lib upload thing. So not within the utils. So we can just remove this, but still it doesn't seem to be correct. Let's see why. If we go to lib and then upload thing, we are exporting something. Let's try to do it automatically. Just use upload thing, use upload, press control space. And no, it seems like we're not exporting it. I believe that's because we won't need to. We won't need this start upload permitted files. We're just going to use the use drop zone hook. So for now, I'm going to delete this entire thing as well as the file types. We can import this from use callback and we can specify which types we accept manually saying a string of image forward slash everything. And we can also define it right here, an array of a string of image forward slash everything. Now I know this file is getting a bit complicated already. We have copy and pasted a lot of stuff, moved around a lot of stuff, and I don't want you to get stuck on this. So what I would rather recommend is that you simply copy and paste the file uploader code from that readme. And then I can go over it line by line and explain everything. So now if I override it right here, let's go over it and explain exactly what it does. And also we can put our code side by side and see if everything is good. But first let's explain it. So first of all, we have our props. We're passing the on field change, the image URL and set files, which we're accepting right here. 
we use the on drop so we know when a file is dropped and we use that by using the use callback that is waiting for specific files. Once we upload the files, we simply set them to the state. And when we change it, we also create a new URL. Then we use this use drop zone and accept only all types of images. And here we have an input that's gonna accept those images. And finally, once it generates the image, we can display it, or we can say select from your computer. That's it. And we're using this file uploader within our form. But now it looks like we have an error. It's saying element type is invalid, expected a string for built-in components or a class function, but got undefined. You likely forgot to export your component. So here we're doing export function file uploader and let's see if we're importing it correctly. This is not a default export. So if I now go back to our event form and see how we imported this file uploader, you can see we did a default import, but rather it should be within braces. There we go. And now we have this beautiful file upload and we can actually select our images and either drag and drop them or just click right here and add it and then you can see it right here. If you click again, it's going to reprompt you to add it and you can simply drag and drop too, which is pretty cool. So now we have the title, we have the description, the category as well, and the form is looking better and better. Now we're back at the form and if we scroll all the way down below the file uploader, we need to add a few more fields. This is a complex form. So we need to add an event location or online and then we have to add the dates as well. Finally, price, is it a free ticket? And then a URL. Now, as you can notice, these below inputs are also gonna have some icons here. So let's see how we can implement that. Let's go below this div right here and create a new div that's going to have the same class name as the last one of a flex, flex-call, gap of five, and on medium devices, flex-row. We want to duplicate the same form field. For example, let's do the first one, which is the input, and then paste it right here. Now, this form field is going to have a name of location, and it's going to render a form item with a form control. But besides the input, this form control is going to include a div that's also going to include an image. This image has to be imported from next image and it's going to have a source equal to forward slash assets, forward slash icons, forward slash location dash gray dot SVG. I believe we spelled it with E, so it's gonna be gray right here. And we also need an alt tag of calendar, a width of 24, a height of 24, and that's it. So if we save it and go back, you can see that a form control cannot accept multiple children. So we have to put this input within this div, right below the image. There we go. Now let's style this div a bit by giving it a class name equal to flex dash center h dash 55 pixels like this in square brackets, w dash full overflow dash hidden rounded dash full, BG gray of 50, padding X of four, and padding Y of two. Finally, we can style the input by giving it the placeholder of event location or online like this. And also the class name is going to be input field. There we go. Now, if you compare the two, you can see it's barely there, but the icon in this case is within the input and here it's outside. And I believe that's because I spelled it with a gray right here with an E. So if we do that, if we change it to gray, BG dash gray dash 50 and reload. Oh, we get an error. That's interesting. Let's see. It looks like the app broke. So let me just rerun it one more time. It happens, don't worry about it. So I'm just gonna rerun it. And now that we have renamed that color, it's looking good. Now we can duplicate this entire div right here, 
right below. And this one is going to be for the date. So instead of a location, we can say start date time, all the classes are going to be similar, if not the same, the image is going to be calendar. Alt is going to be calendar as well. And we can give it a class name equal to filter dash gray with an E. We can then render a P tag right here as well. That's going to say something like start date. And we can give it a class name equal to margin left of three, white space, no wrap, and a text gray 600. There we go. And instead of an input, we want to render a date picker. Yeah, another type of a component or a picker, we had selects, we had inputs, we had all sorts of things. So let's reload the page one more time. And you can see the start date appears right here. But now we have to add a date picker. This date picker is going to come from a package that is conveniently called react date picker. So let's install it by running npm install react dash date picker dash dash save. And then we can use it like this. By importing the date picker from react date picker. By the way, you can just go to npm as well and search for it in case you want to get to the docs. Then we have to add this import line import react date picker CSS. And after that, you need to define the start date right here as the state. And you simply call the date picker component and pass these couple of props. So if we go down, all the way down, we want to call the date picker like this, give it a couple of properties like selected and on change. Selected is actually going to be equal to field dot value. In this case, we don't have to give it a state because Shatsian form and the react hook form are managing it for us. So the on change is going to look like this date is of a type date and we call the field dot on change and we pass that date. Now we can delete this use state because we don't need it. And let's see if react date picker properly got installed. It seems like it did, but it didn't properly remove the error. So if I just reopen the event form, hmm, it's still there. Let's see. Oh, it's saying that we need to install the types for the date picker as well, since we're using TypeScript. So let's do that by running npm i dash dash save dash dev add types forward slash react dash date picker. And now the error is gone. Now let's give it a couple more properties or let's first see how does it look like? Okay, there we go. That's good. Let's also give it a show time select. We're working on an event application after all, right? We need to know when this event is happening. So we have a time picker. We also want to give it a time input label of time like this. We want to give it a date format. Feel free to choose whatever format you prefer. Something like MM, DD, YYY. And then we can also do H, MM, AA. This is kind of a typical format. And then we can give it a wrapper class name equal to date picker. If we save it and reload or just reclick it, it's going to look very nice with these nice theme colors. It's going to look very nice with these theme colors and the input is looking great as well. Sometimes it's better to reuse existing packages that have literally tens of thousands or maybe even more, let's see, 2 million weekly downloads than to reinvent the wheel. Doesn't make sense. It would take you weeks just to build this date picker where you can just reuse it and focus on building the business logic of your specific application. So with that said, we have our start date, but let's duplicate this entire div one more time below. Oh, we have to be careful. It goes all the way down. So copy this entire div, duplicate it below. We're going to change this to end date time. The asset is going to be the same. It's going to say end date. And I believe everything else will be exactly the same. 
So now if I save it, you can see we have start date, which you can select, and we have end date right here. Great. Oh, but there is one mistake I've made. If we now expand this, you're going to notice they're going to go all on their own lines, but rather the start date should have been next to the end date like this. That means that they should have gone into the same div. So the end date is not going to have its own div. Rather, we're going to close this div later on. So both of these are going to be within the same div. If I do it, looks good. And if I expand it, looks good as well. Once again, I know it's a huge form. If you have any issues or if it doesn't work for you, this entire event form is going to be linked in the readme as well. So you can copy and paste it in case you ran into some issues. With that said, we have just a couple more inputs to do. We have the price, the free ticket, and the URL. So let's go ahead and finish all that right away. To get started with the price input, we can create a new div. And this div is going to have, once again, a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, gap of five, and on medium devices, a flex of row. Now within it, we want to duplicate another form field. So let's copy this form field right here that we had for end date time. So all the way here and paste it within it. There we go. Now we're going to replace this name with price. The form item styles and form control can remain the same. The icon is going to be a dollar and the alt is going to be dollar as well. And below this image, instead of rendering a date picker, we can simply render an input. This input will have a type equal to number. It will have a placeholder equal to price. We're going to spread the field and we want to style it a bit, but let's first see it appear right here. There we go. We have our price. So now let's give it a class name equal to P dash regular dash 16 border of zero background of gray 50. Let's call it properly gray. Let's give it the outline of offset zero focus border zero focus dash visible ring of zero. We're eliminating those ugly outlines that you get when you click on it. Focus dash visible ring dash offset dash zero. And now we have a beautiful price input. Great. Now, right below that input, we also want to add the is free Boolean, the one that looks like this. So let's simply create a new form field by duplicating this form field right here. I'm going to copy it all the way until the end and duplicate it right below this one. This form field, if we indent it properly, is going to have a name equal to is free. Its form item will not have a full class name, so we can remove that. There we go. And its div is going to have a class name of something that's much simpler than this one, flex and items dash center. Within there, we don't need an image, so we can simply do a label. Let's create a new label. The label is going to say free ticket. And we can make that an HTML for the is free field. We can also style it by giving it a class name equal to white space, no wrap, padding right of three, leading dash none, peer dash disabled, cursor dash not allowed. Okay, we also want to do this, as well as peer disabled opacity of 70. So now if we just try it out, we can see the free ticket. But of course, we have to add the checkbox instead of the input. So let's remove this input. And let's render a checkbox instead. This checkbox is another component that we have to install. So let's see how to use a checkbox by going to chat CN. And it's going to show us how we can use it. Let's add the checkbox first by saying MPX chat CNUI add latest add checkbox. Then we simply import it at the top and then use it as a checkbox. While it's getting installed, 
Let's get it imported as well from UI checkbox. Let's give it an ID of is free. Let's give it a class name of margin right of two. And let's see how does it look like. If we save it, you can already see it right here. We can give it a height of five, a W of five as well, and a border of two. We can also make it a border primary 500. There we go. That's looking good. Now, why is it not in the same line as it is right here within the price? Well, let's see why that is the case. This form field that we added right here has to go below the input in the other form control. So we're going to take this entire form field and push it a bit right below this input right here. So one, two, three, four, a couple of places above within the div where the input is. So it has to be right below this input. That way it's going to nicely appear in the same line. And if we expand it, it's also going to look good. There we go. Now we have this. And the last thing we have to add is a URL, which is a typical string input. So we can copy the first one we had, which is just the event title. So let's copy the form field for the title. And let's go all the way down, find this last div and still within it. So right below the last form field, paste it, call it URL, give it a W dash full. And then within the form control, we don't simply want to have an input like we have right now. We also want to wrap it in a div because we want to add an image. I think it might've been better if we copied some input with an image. So let's try to find the location maybe instead of the title, I'm going to find the location input. There we go. And I'm going to copy this entire location input and override what I pasted right here. That's going to be this one. Now, instead of location dash gray, we're going to give it an asset of just link and say link right here. The placeholder of the input is going to be URL. And if we save it, you can see it looks wonderful. And don't forget to change the name to URL. This is very important. We're going to keep it lowercase URL. Every single name of these inputs has to correspond to the types we added above. I'm referring to the ones in the event form schema, these ones right here. So I know this was a huge file and we just added all the inputs. We now have to finish it with a button as well. That's going to finally submit everything. So this button is going to be of a type submit, but it will also be of a size LG. Sometimes it's going to be disabled in case we're already submitting the form. So we have to get the form that form state is submitting, then we disable it. We can also have a class name of a button call dash span dash two and W dash full. Also, if we are submitting, we can say something like submitting else we can say create. So here we can open up a new dynamic block of code. There we go. If is submitting in that case, we can render something like submitting and else we can say something like we can render the type and then say event. We're passing this type over to props. So the type is either going to be update or edit. And now if I save it, you can see it's going to say create. And if we're on edit page, it's going to say edit event. So this is looking great. Now, once again, I know this is a lot of code, so bear with me. Now we'll try to figure out how we can submit this form and actually create this document in our database. All of that starts with a form. So here we see form form dot on submit call the handle submit on submit function. So here we have to define what do we want to do with those values. So let's approach it together to get started with writing our submit logic. Let's first console log all the values to see if we're properly getting them. Let's add an event title and we can do that by copying some events that we have right here. Let's go with this one, JSM Nexus. I'm going to copy the title. 
That's looking good. Let's also get this description. Now, oh yeah, we didn't yet add the category. That's also something we have to do. But still, I want to see all the values. So now if I add a category of test, it's not going to do it. We didn't yet fully do the logic. Let's try with the image. I'm going to select this one. Let's say that it is online. The start date has to be in the future. The end date is going to be later. Let's say that it's a free event and it's going to be under jsmastery.pro. Let's click create event. First of all, you can see that the validation is working. That means that we have to make this an actual URL. And it seems like everything went through. So now let's go to inspect and then let's see the console. You can see that we got an object with all of the things right here. Let's see if everything is as it should be. The description is there. The end date time is there. The start date time is there as well. Is free is false. Hmm, that's interesting. Didn't we take it as true? Yeah, I think we did. Yeah, is free is still false. That's interesting. Let's see if it's getting properly updated. If we go to is free, we have it right here. Oh, I don't think we added the updates for the checkbox. That means that we have to say on checked change, we want to call the field dot on change. And similarly, when it's checked, we want to call the field dot value. So is it checked or is it not? Now, if I save it and if I click create event, you can see that now it's still false. But if I go back here and if I click it, now it is true. And the price is just an empty string. The category ID is empty because that's the last thing we still have to do, but everything else is looking great. So let's finish this category ID to allow the user to also create their own category. And then finally, we'll be able to start submitting our form. So let's remember where the category is. We can search for it as well, category. And then we can go into the drop down that we created. And here is where we left off handle add category. And this will be quite exciting, actually, because we'll get to practice our server actions work and fetching the data from the database before we start doing it for the events. So to create the ability to add categories, we can go to actions, and then we can create a new actions file called category.actions.ts. We're going to immediately make it a use server file. And we want to create a new function and export it. Export const create category is equal to an async function that accepts a category name. And we can define the type to be equal to create category params, which we can import from add forward slash types. Let me expand this just a bit. So it looks good. There we go. And now we want to create the ability to create a category. The process is similar as before. We open up a try and catch block. In the catch, we call the handle error and we import it from utils and give it the error. And in the try, we await connect to database, which we call as usual. Then we create a new category by saying const new category is equal to await category dot create. And we pass a name equal to category name. Of course, we have to import category from database models. Now that we create a new category, we can return a JSON dot parse and JSON dot stringify and pass over the new category object. Of course, let's close it properly. Now that we created the create category, let's also create one to fetch all categories. We can do that by copying this server action and pasting it below. We're going to rename it to get all categories. In this case, we don't have to get any params. We do the same thing. We connect the database, but instead of creating a new category, we fetch all the categories by running the category 
that find option and we don't have to pass anything to it. Finally, we simply JSON parse and JSON stringify and return all the categories. So now we have two different actions that allow us to modify the database to create and fetch categories. Now let's go back to our dropdown and let's make use of them. Since we don't have any categories yet, let's create the ability to create some by calling the create category, which we have to import from lib actions and want to pass a category name like this. And it's going to be equal to new category dot trim. We want to trim it. So it's just a string without any extra spaces. And we can call a dot then on it where we get a new category back and we want to call the set categories state where we get the previous state and we set the categories equal to dot, dot, dot previous state. And we pass over the new category. Now that we've done this, let's also create a way to fetch all the categories. And we can do that in the use effect because we want to get it as soon as we load the page. So we can say use effect where we always have to do the same thing, have the callback function and pass the empty dependency array. We need to import use effect from react and we want to say const get categories is equal to an async function where we say const categories is equal to await get all categories. And we just call it like this. And of course, don't forget to import it from the top. Then we simply say, if categories exist, then we want to set categories, categories. One thing that might make it a bit more obvious what we're doing is to rename it to category list instead of categories. That way we're going to know that the category list is the new list we have. And here we have the state. So that's different. We also can define a type for this category list as I category and then array. So now we know exactly what we're getting back and we have to call this get categories whenever this use effect runs. So now we're handling the creation of the categories as well as fetching new ones and then displaying them right here. Now, if I save this and go back, if I open it, it says nothing. We don't have any categories but let's try to create one. If I click open, it will allow us to add it. And maybe open is not the right word. Let's see how we have it here on the finished website. So if I go to create event, instead of open, it says add new category. Yes, that's much better. So let me go down where it says open. Where is it? There we go. And let's say add new category. If I save it, that now makes more sense. And let's add a category of something like let's do next yes. And click add. And would you look at that? It is there and we can select it. But how do we know that this really works? Well, first of all, if you reload the page, which I shouldn't have done because now I have to fill out all the data, but it is there, which means it's actually coming from the database. So if we go to our MongoDB Atlas, and then reload the page. We now have a new collection of categories. And would you look at that? There is one object with the name of Next.js, which means that we have successfully mutated the database and then made a fetch to it. Great. Now that we know that all of the fields from our form are getting through, we have to actually pass them to the backend, which is exactly where we were once we figured out that we are yet to do the dropdown. But now that everything is done, we're back in here and we are ready to implement the on submit and make our front end talk to the back end. To get started, first, we have to fuse all of our data from the form, all of the inputs and the categories and drop downs and stuff like that with our image, because we have to get the URL from the image, not just the entire image we uploaded. For that reason, let's do something like this. Let's first define a new object called event data and make that equal to essentially what we have so far, all of the values from our form. Then we want to get the uploaded image by saying, let uploaded image URL is equal to values dot image URL. 
Then we want to check if the user has uploaded any images by saying if files that length is greater than zero. In that case, we want to upload them by saying const uploaded images is equal to await start upload. And we'll pass over all the files that we have. But of course, this start upload is another thing which is going to come from upload thing. So right at the top here, we can define const start upload is coming from or rather is equal to use upload thing. And then we pass a string of image uploader. And this use upload thing is going to come from upload thing. So we have to import it properly by saying import use upload thing is coming from at forward slash lib forward slash upload thing. There we go. From there, let's see if we're exporting something. Right now, it seems we're not exporting the use upload thing, but we can get it from here by saying use upload thing. There we go. Export const use upload thing is equal to generate components we have here, but we can also do generate react helpers. That's what we need in this case, generate react helpers coming from at upload thing forward slash react forward slash hooks. And then we can say generate react helpers. And then we get use upload thing, as well as upload files. I think I pulled this previous file from another documentation page and not the one that we need to use. So in this case, we just fixed it. Going back, now we're using this use upload thing, which is giving us access to start upload. Immediately, we can notice that we're using await, so we have to make this function async. Once we get the uploaded images, we can check if they exist by saying if no uploaded images, then we can simply return, meaning exit out of the function. Else, we can map over them by saying uploaded image URL is equal to uploaded images zero dot URL. And now that means that we have our uploaded image URL as well as our event data or the values. I don't think we need to do it like this. There we go. So now we go below this function once we're sure we have the image. And then we say if type is triple equal to create, meaning if we're creating the post and not updating it. In that case, we want to open up a new try and catch block. In the catch, we simply console log the error, but in the try is where the magic happens. Here, we can say const new event is equal to await create event, like so. Of course, we don't yet have that function, and it starts with a lowercase c, but we will create it soon. And to it, we want to pass the event, which is equal to an object where we spread all the values and also add the image URL, like so. We need to pass the user ID of the user that created that event. And we also need to pass a path where we're going to be redirected later on so we can revalidate that path and show new things. So that's going to be forward slash profile. And finally, once we create a new event, we want to see if the new event exists. In that case, we want to run the form dot reset to reset the form and use the router dot push. But of course, we have to import that router at the top by defining it. Const router is equal to use router coming from next router. Or no, I think the autofill messed with me right here. It's not next router, it's next navigation. We have to be careful. There we go. So now we can call the router dot push. And once we create an event, we want to go to forward slash events, forward slash new event dot underscore ID. So we want to go to its details page. Of course, for now, I want to comment out this entire thing because the create event function doesn't yet exist. So let's go ahead and create the create event action right now so we can make that handshake between the front end and the back end happen. We can do that by creating a new file 
called event.actions.ts. And then we can immediately define it as use server as here, we're going to have server actions. And the first action we want to create, of course, is export const create event, which is going to be an async function in which we receive three things, the event data itself, the user ID, as well as the path to revalidate. And that's going to be of a type create event params. We should be able to import those from our types, but let's just first finish writing this function. There we go. Create event params coming from types. Of course, we need to make this an actual arrow function. There we go. Now within here, we're going to do everything we're already used to try and catch block where we handle the errors right here and pass the error. And in our try, we first want to await connect to our database. There we go. Now, first, we need to figure out who is the organizer of this event. So let's try to find them by saying const organizer is equal to await user dot find by ID. And we want to pass in the user ID. Of course, we have to import the user model from database models. Next, if an organizer doesn't exist, so if no organizer, throw a new error organizer not found. But if we do have an organizer, we can create a new event by saying const new event is equal to await event, which we need to import from database dot create to which we spread the entire event past the category as well of event dot category ID and pass the organizer as the user ID. There we go. And of course, we have to name this category ID. So now we're passing everything we need into our event dot create to be able to create an event with specific form data within a specific category organized by a specific user. Finally, we want to return JSON dot parse, and then JSON dot stringify new event. There we go. Now we have our create event function and we can try calling it within our form. So if we bring this back and if we import create event, we can see that TypeScript is not complaining. Everything is looking good and we can give it a shot and try to create an event. Let's do that by trying to create a new event that we had before. So let's try to go with a different one, such as GitHub universe. This time we can copy the title. We can enter the category, something like AI in this case. So let's choose add a new category of AI or artificial intelligence. Let's copy the description as well. Let's upload a new photo. I'm going to do it for real by copying this one and duplicating it. And we can also drag and drop it here so I can show you how that works. There we go. Finally, we need to choose online. We can make a start date go from, let's say a week from now and similar for the end date a bit later, we can make this a free event or let's go give it a price of something like let's do 100 bucks. The URL can once again be jsmastery.pro and we can click create event. Now, a couple of things will happen once we click that button. The form will initiate this on submit. Then the on submit will call the server action of create event, which will then connect to our database, figure out if we have an organizer and finally create an event in the database. So just to ensure it works out, I'm going to open up the console to monitor for the errors. And I want to do the same on our desktop. So let's try to open up inspect element and just open up our network tab to see if anything weird is happening. Let's click create event. Okay. Upload thing is working. The image is uploaded. We're getting server call back 200 and we got a 500 form create. That means a server error. Let's see what happened. Preview error add handle. Nothing too useful here. 
but maybe we get something more useful here in our code base. So let's go here. And yes, we have an error with json.stringify error at the handle error function. Okay, that's interesting. So throw new error, json.stringify error. Hmm, doesn't say too much. If I keep going through this, yeah, nothing too useful is showing here. Maybe in the console, error, handle, error. No, nothing useful. Cannot read properties of undefy. No, this is my extension. So yeah, this is not really useful. Let's keep this open to have all the data here. We can easily just recreate it to see once again what's happening. But let's try to debug it for now. The only useful error that we have is this one saying throw new error, type of error is string, else JSON that string if I error, and it's saying error nothing. It's an empty object. So that's a bit weird. What we can try to do is we know that it's coming from here. We can try to console log it here as well before the handle error. Error just caught it, but we want to see what the error is. So if I do that, and if I re-click create event, it's submitting still. It's uploading the image, I'm guessing. And now it says error. This is coming from event form 68. And we get a 500 at events create. So still it didn't go through. And still nothing useful here. Let's try to go to our event form 68, which is right here. There we go. So this one is actually erroring out the call to our create event. Hmm. Which again points us back to the event and then again to this handle error here. Let's try to click this post request here and try to dig deeper here. Let's look into the headers. We seem to be passing the correct data. Let's see. Yeah, this is looking okay. We're going to events create. The payload should contain everything we want to work with. The event has the category ID, the description, end date, image URL, is free, price, location, start date, title URL, the path of profile. Oh, but would you look at that? The user ID is undefined. That could be because while I was recording this, I left my PC for a while and then it locked me out. But here, it still seems we're logged in. So maybe we're just passing the ID the wrong way. Let's see, user ID, is coming right here, user ID. And then in the create event, we're passing user ID, which is coming from our params. And this user ID is getting passed to the event form. So let's see where we're calling the event form. It's in the page of create event. And here we seem to be passing the user ID from session claims. Oh, but this is one thing. Yeah. So we didn't get logged out, but I forgot to add the user ID to the metadata of our clerk account. I'm really glad this error happened. We need to do something known as customizing our session token. Our session tokens are JWT tokens generated by clerk on our behalf. They typically contain a standard set of claims for clerk to function. However, you can customize them to retrieve data at any point such as in this case, we were retrieving our user ID. So how to customize it? We have to go to our clerk dashboard, to sessions, click edit, and then we have to specify what we wanna add. And then we'll be able to retrieve it the way we're trying to do it right now. So let's go to our clerk dashboard, then navigate to sessions and customize session token. Here, we have to expose our user metadata under the user ID. So we can say user ID is going to be equal to, and now we have to get it like so. I believe that's gonna be user public metadata, but specifically wanna go for the user, user ID like this. Now, if we save it, let's just go back to our user. You might have one, I have more. And let's just verify that our user indeed has the metadata. For some reason, my user doesn't. Maybe because we have created it before we have added the ability to add the metadata. So let me just edit it manually by going to edit. And then we can just copy this entire object ID if I can do that. There we go. I believe I'm good. 
You can also do the same or just feel free to delete your account and recreate an account on our Evently application or sign in using a different account. Then if we add the user ID manually right here and press save, now we have it under public and we have added it under this session claims. So now if we open up and reload the page, we still get only user ID. So it seems like it cannot get it. Hmm, interesting. Let's think about this further. Since in our profile, we had it under public metadata, we can do a similar thing here. Just say public underscore metadata and save. Now, if we go back and reload, you can see that we get back a real user ID. Great. So now we know that we're passing that user ID to the event form, and hopefully now it should be passed over all the way to when we create an event, and that should allow us to actually create it. So one more time, allow me to fill this out and click Create. It's submitting. It's uploading. There we go. That's good. It's uploaded, but this time we got a different kind of error. It says string value user cast error cast to object ID failed for value user ID this ID. Interesting. Let's also open up the console here. And we get a similar error. If we go to network and try to just resubmit it, you'll also be able to see the same thing. And if you scroll a bit above, you can see right here that we have a string value of user ID and it's saying that input must be a 24 character hex string. So is it possible that I messed up with copying my string? Let's see if I go to our database. We have 6575 ending in 69F, that is our ID. And if I go right here, 657569F, this looks good to me. Just to be safe, let me try to just log in with a new account and start it all over. I logged in from a new account, this time not real JSM, but JS Mastery, and I'll try to click create event. It's submitting it uploading. And there we go, we have the same error. Let's start working off of the information that is provided to us. Here, we can see that we're accepting some kind of string value of an empty object. And it's saying that the reason is that the input must be a 24 character hex string. And this is referring to the object ID of a specific document. And if we go to our models right here, specifically the event model, we can notice that we only have two instances where we have an ID. It can be a user that is creating it, where we need to pass the reference to the object ID of the user creating it, or it could be the category ID we're connecting to it. So one of those two in our case is not a full object ID string. So let's figure it out. I close all of the files that I had opened I like to do this when I'm starting with the debugging process. And I want to go to actions event right here. And because this is where it's actually failing, we're passing the category ID and the organizer ID right here. And one of these is not what it should be. So what we can do is we can console.log instead of an object, the category ID equal to event.category ID and the organizer ID which is going to be equal to the user ID. And we can see which one of these two is empty or faulty. So what we can do is now just click create event. This should be happening on the back end side. So we should be able to see it right here in our console. There we go. We get our typical error, but if we scroll a bit up, do we get anything else? Not really. I don't see much. It's easy to miss it right here. Let's open up the console on our browser as well. And go here. Same error that we had before. But if we go to the network tab, maybe we can see it there. So let's click create event. It's going to do the same thing once again. But this time we should be able to see what the server says. We have a 500. And we can see exactly the data we're passing. The category ID is right here. It's looking good. 
But as you can see, the user ID is an empty object. That's not looking good. So maybe it's related to that error that we had before, not properly getting the user ID from Clerk. To fix it, we can go back to our page where we create an event. So that's events create, and we can figure out what value this returns by simply running console log user ID. Now this should happen once we open up the create page. I don't want to mess with my data right here. So I'm going to open up a new one in a new tab. And once you do that and go to the console, you can see that we have an object of user ID. So instead of saying user ID, we should be saying user ID dot user ID, which is not the best way to do it. So instead of fixing it here, let's fix it in the clerk dashboard right here where we customized our token. We can re-edit it one more time. And this time we can say user dot public metadata dot user ID. That way we're getting exactly what we need. We can click save. And now if we go back here and reload, you can see that now we only get the user ID and not an object. So now that we know that we're getting exactly what we need and passing it over to the event form, we can once again, try to create a new post. Let's go to Evently. Let's reload it once again to ensure that we have a completely new empty slate with all of the changes we implemented. And let's add a new event. There we go. I sped up the process for you. And I'm going to click Create while before opening this up and clicking Create. Our upload thing server is running. We're trying to upload the image. We get back the category ID and the organizer ID. And we were successfully redirected to another page. In this case, the event details page. It's fine that we got a 404 because we haven't yet implemented that page. As a matter of fact, let's do that now. And we can do that if we go to our app root events and then create a new ID like this. That's going to be for our details. And within it, we can create a new page.tsx. We can run RAFCE and that's it. Now we have our page right here. So we have successfully been redirected to a proper page and to fully verify that we have created an event. Let's go to MongoDB Atlas. And then navigate over to our events only to be greeted with the complete event in the database with the organizer connected to its own user the category connected to its own reference and all the data right here. That's great. Now we have two different avenues we can continue working off of. We can create the event details page, or we can start fetching all the events on our homepage. What do you think we should do first? Well, since we are already redirected to the event details page, let's go ahead and code that first. That's going to look something like this, where we have all of this information here, the image, the title, the creator, and then all the related events as well. We'll be able to see the product of what we worked so hard to achieve. So let's close all the tabs that we no longer need. And we just have our local host, our MongoDB Atlas, which we also don't need because now we know that the creation is working. And let's just make our local host look like the finished website. So we can get started with working on this page right here. To get started, we'll first have to make another call to our event actions to get all of the post details corresponding to that specific post. So let's quickly rename this to event details. And let's immediately head over to our actions, which is going to be under lib actions, event actions. And here below our create event, we can create a second event action called get event by ID. So export const get event by ID is equal to an ASIC function that accepts an event ID of a type string. And you know the drill, we simply open up a try and catch block. In the error, we simply handle error right here. And in the try, we try to connect to our database. And then we just try to get the event by saying const event is equal to await event dot find by ID. And we pass over the event ID. 
And then of course, we can say if there is no event, we can then throw a new error. But if there is one, we simply return a JSON parse JSON stringify event. Now, this is not the end of it. That's because we have to populate the information about the creator. You see, if we only call this event, it's going to have a property of organizer that's just going to have the ID of that specific user. But instead of an ID, we want to get the actual user's name, such as this one right here. And instead of a category ID, we want to populate the category title. So to do that, we can create a new function that we're going to reuse across more of these actions. It's going to be called const populate event. It's going to be an async function that takes in a query of a type any and returns a query dot populate. So this is what we want to call dot populate. And we want to populate a path of organizer where a model is of a type user. So model is user. And we want to select what we want to populate in a string of ID, first name, and last name as well. We can do the similar thing to populate the category. So category model is category. And we want to select the ID. And we don't have the first and last name here. But instead, we simply have the name. And we want to import the category from models category. So this is how that looks like. We have the populate event. And now we just want to wrap the event that find by ID with the populate, which is going to provide us, as I said, not just the ID of the category or of the organizer, but rather their full names. Great. So now we're returning that right here, and we can call the get event by ID from our page. So to do that, let's collapse this just a bit. And right at the top, we can make this an async function. And here's the cool part. Notice that we are on a specific domain, forward slash events, forward slash, and then we have the entire ID of the event right here in our URL params. So how can we get access to those params? Well, Next.js makes it so easy. The only thing you have to do is say params, and then destructure the param you want to get. That param is going to have the same name as the name of the variable you added right here. In our case, that's the ID. And then you can say that this is of a type search param props, which we need to import from the types. Now that we have the ID, the only thing left for us to do is to get the actual event details by saying const event is equal to await get event by ID, and we pass in the ID. The get event by ID, of course, being the action we just created. It is so easy working in modern Next.js applications. You get the data from the server and you immediately have it right here in your front end, which is also going to be rendered on the server for optimization. Now, it looks like I misspelled something. I misspelled the path. So that's most likely going to happen here. If I look for it, maybe in the populate. Yeah, it's supposed to be category. So if I spell it properly, that should be good. And just for good measure, let's just console log the event to see what data we're getting back. There we go. We're getting everything we need. As you can see, the organizer also includes the first and last name, and the category includes the name as well. So now that we have all of that data, let's simply create the presentation for it. We're going to wrap everything in a section. That section is going to have a class name equal to flex, justify dash center, bg dash primary dash 50, bg dash dotted dash pattern, and bg dash contain. Then right within it, we want to have a div. And that div is going to have a class name equal to grid, grid dash calls dash one, on medium devices, grid dash calls dash two, and on two Excel devices, max dash W dash seven Excel. We're just creating the layout for now. Within it, we want to show the event image, which of course we have to import the next image for, and we have to give it a source equal to event dot 
image URL. We can also give it an alt tag of hero image. We can give it a width of about a thousand as well as a height of about a thousand as well. And then we also have to give it a class name of h full min h 300 pixels like this object dash cover and object dash center. Now, if you notice this, our next JS will try to protect us saying that we cannot render an image from an unknown source. So we have to go to next.config.js and add the upload thing server to our list of secure image providers. So let's go to our next.config.js. And here we can say images. And then under domains, we can add an array of utfs.io. After this, we'll have to reload our application. So just run npm run dev one more time. And there we go. We can see the image, but we can see that image.domains is deprecated. Instead, we need to use remote patterns. So let's stay up to date and let's say remote patterns is an array of an object where we have a protocol of HTTPS, a host name of utfs.io in a string, of course. And finally, we have a port, which we don't have to define. So now if we save it, it's not going to complain and we can still see our image. Great. Now going back below the image, we want to show all the additional information, which is going to be considered our details box. And I can see our app is still loading. So let's see what that is about. Once we modify the config, it has to recompile it. And in this case, it recompiled successfully. So right below the image, let's have a div that's going to have a class name equal to flex w dash full flex dash call gap of eight padding of five and on medium devices padding of 10. This entire time, we're just working on creating the layout for what is yet to become this event details page. Right within that div, we want to have another div that's going to have a class name equal to flex flex dash call and a gap of six right within it. We can finally render our H2 that's going to render the first piece of data for our event besides the image, which is the event dot title. Let's make it a bit more pronounced by giving it a class name of H2 dash bold. There we go. That's better. Now below this H2, let's also render a div that's going to have a class name equal to, and let's spell it properly, flex, flex dash call, gap dash three on small devices, flex dash row, and on small devices, items dash center. Within it, we can show another div that's going to have a class name equal to flex and a gap of three. And within it, we can show whether this event is free or if it has a price within a P tag. So there we can say event dot is free. In that case, we can say free else we can render the dollar amount and then the event price. In this case, it's going to be $100. Let's make it look a bit better by giving it a class name equal to P dash bold dash 20 rounded dash full BG dash green dash 500 over 10 padding X of five padding Y of two and text green 700. There we go. That's better already. It makes it seem cheaper as it's green. And then we want to go one P tag below and add another P tag. This one is going to render the event dot category dot name. And we want to give it a class name equal to P dash medium dash 16 rounded dash full BG dash gray dash 500 over 10 padding X of four padding Y of 2.5 and text dash gray of 500. There we go. In this case, it's just says AI, which is two letters, but it can also be longer. Then we want to exit just one div and below it, create another P tag. This one is going to have a class name 
equal to p dash medium dash 18, margin left of 2, margin top of 2, and on small devices, margin top of 0. There, we can say something like by create a space like so, and then render a span element where we can render the event dot organizer dot first name, and we can pair it with event dot organizer dot last name as well. So if we save it, you can see Adrian at JS Mastery. And we can give this span a class name equal to text dash primary dash 500. There we go. That's looking better. Now below it, we can render this buy ticket button, which for now, we're just going to leave empty right here. If we go one, two divs below, we can render the checkout button. But for now, let's finalize all the other details, such as the date, time, location, description, and more. We can do that by creating another div that's going to have a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, and a gap of five. Then we can have another div within it that's going to have a class name equal to flex, gap of two, and on medium devices, a gap of three. And by the way, I want to take a moment to ask you, what do you think of these three dots hiding the class names? Do they make the coding easier or do they make it much harder to watch what I'm doing? Please let me know in the comments down below and I will revert back to not using this extension if that's what you prefer. Or if you prefer it, let me know and I'll keep using it. Now, right here, we want to render an image. And this image is going to have a source equal to forward slash assets, forward slash icons, forward slash calendar dot SVG with an alt tag of calendar, a width of about 32 pixels, and a height of 32 pixels as well. Finally, below that image, we can render a div that's going to have a P tag of format date and time coming from libutils, which we can call like this and pass it the event dot start date time. And this is going to be the date. So we can call the dot date only method on it. And below it, we're going to render another P tag with a class name equal to ML one to create some spacing. And instead of date only, we're going to render the time only. We want to provide a dash and then some spacing in between like this. And we want to duplicate it and render the format time only, but this time it's going to be end date time like this end date time. If we save it, you should be able to see starting here, ending here. And if we compare it to the finished website, you can see how it should look like. So what we can do is we can provide a class name to this div, such as a P dash medium of 16 on large devices, P regular of 20 flex flex dash wrap and items dash center. And now we can see Tuesday, December 19th, and we can see the time from and time to, but we might also want to add the date from that will make sense, right? So let's try to make it make a bit more sense. We have the start time right here, or rather start date. Next to it, we can render the start time by copying this entire thing and placing it right below format date time, start date time, and then time only. And then below this, we can have another P that's going to render the same thing if we duplicate it, but this time it's going to say end date time, date only and time only then it's going to look like this. That makes a bit more sense from December 19, 1225 to December 26, 1225. That is great. And in case you want to add a space here, you need to do it like so space and space here. That is great. Finally, we can add all of the remaining details. So let's go two divs down 
and let's create another wrapper div that's going to have a class name equal to p dash regular dash 20 flex items dash center gap of three. Then we want to have an image and that image will have a source equal to forward slash assets forward slash icons forward slash location dot SVG. We also want to give it an alt tag equal to that's going to be location with a width of 32 and a height of 32 as well. Right below it, we want to have a P tag that's going to render the event dot location. And we can style it a bit by giving it a class name equal to P dash medium dash 16 on large devices, P dash regular dash 20. If we save it and go back, you can see the online tag looks great. We can once again, go two divs down and create another wrapper div. That's going to have a class name equal to flex, flex dash call and a gap of two. There we can render a P tag that's going to have a class name equal to P dash bold dash 20 text dash gray dash 600. And we can say something like what you'll learn. There we go. Right below it, we can have another P tag that's going to have a class name equal to P dash medium dash 16 and on large devices, P dash regular dash 18. There we can render the event dot description. And right below it, we can duplicate this P tag. And on top of giving it a large regular 18, we can also truncate it and give it a text primary 500 as well as underline. And here we can render the event dot URL. So now if we save it and collapse our Visual Studio code, you can see that this is looking great. We have our description and we have our URL. This is looking more like it. That's great. But now there are two additional things we have to do. The first one is to add a buy ticket button, which we're going to do later on once we start adding the Stripe integration, which is going to be quite exciting. And then the other one is rendering the related events. Since as of this moment, this is the only event that we have, we're not going to focus on adding related ones yet. We'll do that soon. But what do you say that now we finally go back to the homepage and display this new event that we worked so hard to create and to get on our platform. To do that, we can go all the way back to our homepage by navigating to page under the root folder. And here we have our search and category filter. And below we can render all of our posts. So before we add the search and category filter, let's immediately render a new component called collection. It's going to be a self-closing component, which we have to add to our components shared called collection dot TSX, where we can run RAFCE and we can immediately import it right from here. Make sure to import the collection from components. And there we go. You can see collection. Now it's our turn to pass everything we need to pass to this collection and then start displaying that data similarly to what we are doing right here on our final deployed website, where we have our events listed one after another. So what we can do is we can first pass data equal to that's going to be events. So first thing that we need, of course, is data, which is the data for the actual events. For now, I'm going to leave it as an empty array. We also want to pass an empty title, meaning what's going to be showing in case we don't have any events. We can say something like no events found. Then we can add empty state subtext, which is going to be something like, let's do come back later. We can also add a collection type equal to all events, because this collection is going to be reusable and we're going to reuse it for a couple of other things. One of which is the related events. 
If you pay close attention, you're going to notice that these related events are also a collection of reusable event cards, same that we use on our homepage. So we have to provide the correct collection type. We also can provide a limit, which we're going to provide later on. For now, we can leave it as six. We need to provide which page we're on. For now, I'm going to leave it as one. And we need to provide the total number of pages that we have. For now, I'm just going to hard code it to two. All of this data has to properly be passed to the collection, which can then be accepted through props. So let's immediately define all of the variables we're passing. First, we have the data. Then we have the empty title. After that, we have the empty state subtext. We have the page, the total pages, which we can default to zero. We have the collection type, and we have the URL param name, more on that later. And all of these are going to be of a type collection props, which we have to define above by saying type collection props is equal to an object where data is of a type I event. So event interface like this, and then an array of those events. The empty title is going to be a string. The empty state subtext is also going to be a string. Limit is going to be a number. Page is going to be a number or a string. Total pages is going to be optional, which we can denote by this question mark right here of a type number. URL param name is also going to be optional and of a type string. And then the collection type is going to be optional of a type events underscore organized or my underscore tickets or all underscore events. So now we know exactly what we're accepting into our collection. And before we start coding it out, we have to get the event data. That's the thing we have to do. Because now if we fix this empty type, there we go. Everything we're passing is good besides the data. It's empty right now. So right at the top of this page, let's go ahead and fetch all of the events we have created so far, which in our case will be this great GitHub Universe event. To start fetching our events, we can go to our event actions, which is right here within lib actions, event actions, and below the create event and get event by ID, we want to create another one. So let's do it by first duplicating our get event by ID, and let's rename it to get all events. This one is going to be even simpler. It will accept a couple of things as params. We want to get a query. We want to get a limit, which we can set to default to six, the page we're currently on, as well as the category we are returning. And this is going to be of a type get all event params. Now, first things first, we connect to the database. And then we want to implement all the queries before we actually go ahead and fetch the events. Now, before we start querying specific events based off of the title and category, let's first return all of the events by first specifying the events query, const events query is equal to event dot find. And here later on, we can pass our conditions. For now, we're going to declare those conditions above as an empty object. But soon enough, we're going to add the title, the query string, the category and more to allow for sorting and filtering. Now we also want to call the dot sort on it and sort it by created at in the descending order. So the new ones are going to appear on top. We want to call the dot skip and we want to skip it by a specific amount for now zero. And then we want to add a limit of how many we want to return. We can limit it by the limit which is six by default. Then we can say const events is equal to await populate event to which we pass the events query. Now it would also be good to know the total number of events that we are returning. That way we can implement pagination. So we can say const events count is equal to await 
event.count document based off of these conditions. Finally, instead of returning just this JSON parse and JSON stringify, we can return a full object where the data is equal to JSON parse and JSON stringify events. And then the total pages is going to be equal to math.seal. So we want to get the top number of the events count divided by the limit. And now we are returning all the events. So now let's go back to our current version of the application. And let's try to fetch those events right here. We can do that by saying const events is equal to await get all events. And of course, we have to import it from get all events from lib actions. Now you can see that we have to make this function async. So async function home. And this get all events requires us to pass a couple of params. It needs a query, which we have to define. So what is that query? Well, for now, it's going to be an empty string because we're trying to get all, but soon enough, it's going to be the query we're going to modify based off of the search right here. Then after the query, we also have to pass a category, which is also going to be empty for now. We also have a page, which is going to be equal to let's just do one for now. And then we have a limit, which can be set to something like six. And this is how we get all the events. So for now, let's simply console log the events and let's see if they're coming back. This entire page is a server page. So if we're getting anything back, we should be able to see it right here within our console. And indeed we do. We see data with an array of one object where we see our GitHub Universe 2023 event and the total page number of one, which is exactly what we expected. So with that in mind, we can now pass these events right here to our collection by saying events question mark dot data. Now we can move into our collection and we can start implementing the look and feel for what are yet to become these cards right here. So to get started, we can immediately return an empty react fragment. And then within it, check if we have something within our data by checking the data dot length is greater than zero. If that is the case, we can return a div and else right here, we can return another div that's going to have an empty state. So in here, we can simply do something like h3 that's going to render the empty title and the p tag that's going to render the empty state subtext. Now we are not going to be able to see it because we do have one event. So if I do data zero and then dot title, we should be able to see it right here, GitHub universe 2023. But if we for a second imagined that this requires at least two events to show, then we can see no events found come back later. Let's style this error message or just the no events message a bit better by giving this div a class name equal to flex dash center wrapper min dash h dash 200 pixels w dash full flex dash call gap of three between the elements rounded dash 14 pixels like this bg dash gray dash 50 like this padding y of 28 and text dash center there we go. That's better. Let's also style the H3 by giving it a class name of P dash bold dash 20 and on medium devices, H5 dash bold. There we go. And a bit smaller class name of P dash regular dash 14 for our MTP tag. Great. Now we can get back to reality because we know we have one event and we can start creating this wonderful card for each event. First, let's create a wrapper div for all of these events by giving it a class name equal to grid w dash full grid dash calls dash one gap of five. On small devices, we want to show two 
per column. So we can say grid dash calls dash two on large devices, grid dash calls dash three, and on extra large devices, a gap of 10. That's not going to change too much right now. But as soon as we render the data within a UL, an unordered list, that's going to have a class name equal to grid. So we're going to render these cards within a grid with a w dash full grid dash calls dash one, a gap of five. And it looks like I confused those two class names. Whatever we added here in the above grid should go into the UL. So we can just copy it and paste it here. That was my bad. But the div that's the wrapper should have a class name of flex flex dash call because on top we're going to have the elements, but on the bottom, we're going to have the pagination, the item center to center it and a gap of 10. So now we have the styles both for the UL and for the div. Finally, we are ready to render the elements by saying data dot map, where we get each individual event. And for each event, we don't automatically return something, but rather we have to check whether we are on the events organized or my tickets, because based off of that, we'll be able to render some additional things within each card. So we can say const has order link. And that's only the case if our collection type is triple equal to events underscore organized. Similarly, we can say const hide price. And that's going to be the case if the collection type is equal to my tickets, because then we already know the price. Now that we have those two additional pieces of information, we can return an li that has a key equal to event dot underscore ID with a class name equal to flex and justify dash center. Finally, within it, we want to render our new component called card. So let's go ahead and create this card within shared components by creating a new card dot TSX component, inside of which we can run RAFCE. Doing that, we can go back in here and we can render the self closing card component, which we need to import from that slash card. Now we can see just the card, but to that card, now we want to pass the entire event by saying event is equal to event has order link is equal to has order link and the hide price is equal to hide price. Finally, we are ready to go into the card and start implementing it. We already know which props does this card take in, it's going to be the event itself, the has order link, and the hide price. And that is equal to card props type which we have to define above by saying type card props is equal to an object where the event is of a type I as an interface event coming from models event model has order link, which is going to be optional of a type Boolean and height price optional of a type Boolean. So now we can start creating what is yet to become our card by first wrapping everything in a div and giving it a class name equal to group relative flex min dash h dash 380 pixels w dash full max dash w dash 400 pixels flex dash call overflow dash hidden rounded dash xl bg dash white shadow dash md transition dash all on hover shadow dash lg on medium devices min dash h dash 438 pixels a lot of classes but we're going to end up with a nice looking card we can now make that entire card clickable by creating a new nextjs link right within it coming from next link it's going to have an href pointing to forward slash events forward slash event dot underscore ID. 
It's also going to have some unique styles. So let's put this in a new line and let's give it a style property equal to background image. That's going to have the value of URL event dot image URL. So if we save it, we cannot see anything, but if we add a class name equal to flex dash center, flex dash grow, BG dash gray of 50, BG dash cover, BG dash center, and a text gray of 500, you can see this great looking image. Then later on, we have to figure out if we are the creator of the event. If we are, we can add some additional functionalities such as update or delete buttons to our event. For now, I'm just going to say is event creator, and then we can implement it soon enough. But for now, I just want to add everything else to our card details. And that's going to go below our link because this link is going to be a self closing link that simply renders the image. Then we have the is event creator. And then below that link, we have another link that has the same href. So let's copy the start of this link and paste it here. It's a link with an href of forward slash events, forward slash event ID. But within here, we're going to show our details of the card, not just the image. So let's give the link a class name equal to flex min dash h dash 230 pixels. That's the height of the details flex dash call. So they appear one below another and a gap of three, a padding of five and on medium devices, a gap of four. Within here, we can have one more div that's going to have a class name equal to flex gap of two. And within it, we want to have a span. This span is going to say event dot is free. If that is the case, then we can render free else we can render the dollar sign and then event dot price, which is going to look something like this. And now we can start seeing it right here. Let's compare it to the finished card. There we go. This is how it looks like. So we are getting there step by step. Let's style this span element by giving it a class name of P dash semi bold dash 14 W dash min rounded dash full BG dash green dash 100 padding X of four padding Y of one and text dash green dash 60. There we go. So now we have a nice looking pill like shape. Below this span, we can add a P tag that's going to render the event dot category dot name. We can also spice it up a bit by giving it a class name equal to P dash semi bold dash 14 W dash min rounded dash full BG dash gray 500 over 10 padding X of four padding Y of one and text dash gray dash 500. There we go. That's better already. Now this will only show if we're not hiding the price. So we can wrap this entire div with a flex of two in a conditional rendering by saying if not hide price, then and and render this else we simply don't want to show it. So we can close it right here. In this case, we do have the price so we can show it. We now want to go below this and render a P tag that's going to render the format date time to which we pass the event dot start date time. And then we render the date time by saying dot date time. That's going to give us the correct date and time when the event is starting. We can style it a bit by giving it a class name equal to P dash medium dash 16 P dash medium dash 18 and text dash gray dash 500. We can now go below and render another P tag. And this is going to be for the event dot title. This of course has to be much bigger. So we can give it a class name equal to P dash medium dash 16 on medium devices, 
P dash medium dash 20, line dash clamp dash two, meaning that it can extend over two lines, flex dash one, and text dash black. If we save it, that's looking good. And finally, we need to know who is organizing the event. So if we go below this P tag, we can create another div that's going to have a class name equal to flex dash between and W dash full. And here we can render a P tag that's going to have a class name equal to P dash medium dash 14 on medium devices, P dash medium dash 16 and a text gray of 600. There we can render our organizer name by doing it like this, event dot organizer dot first name, and right after it, event dot organizer dot last name. There we go. That's looking good. And then we want to figure out if we have the order link, meaning have we bought this event already? So right below the speed tag, we can say if has order link, then display a link that's going to have an href pointing to forward slash orders, question mark, event ID is equal to event dot underscore ID. We can also give it a class name equal to flex and a gap of two. And if we do have a link, if we have purchased this, we can render a P tag that's going to say order details, give it a class name equal to text dash primary dash 500. And finally, we can show an arrow to move to our order by rendering an image, which has to be imported from next image with a source of forward slash assets, forward slash icons, forward slash arrow dot SVG. We can also give it an alt tag of search, a width of 10, and a height of 10 as well. We cannot see it right now because we're looking at this event on the homepage. We haven't bought it, but if we buy an event, then we'll see a link that's going to lead us to the order details page. But on the other hand, we have created this event. So we need to fill out this part is event creator. In this case, we are. So to be able to figure that out, we have to create some additional logic right here in this component. And that is we have to figure out if the user ID of the user that is currently logged in is the same user ID of the organizer of that event. And we can do that by saying const session claims is equal to auth, which has to be imported from clerk next.js. Then from session claims, we can get the user ID by saying const user ID is equal to session claims question mark dot user ID as string. And then we can create a simple Boolean variable const is event creator. And that's going to be a check where we check if user ID is triple equal to event dot organizer dot ID, but we can call a dot to string on it because sometimes the ID is the MongoDB object ID and we want it to be a string because we're doing a string comparison. Now, based off of this variable right here, we can check if is event creator and if not height price, then we want to show something. And that something is a div that's going to render a link that's going to have an href pointing to forward slash events, forward slash event dot underscore ID forward slash update. Within that link, we can render an image that's going to have a source equal to forward slash assets, forward slash icons, forward slash edit dot SVG with an alt tag of edit and a width of 20 and a height of 20. If we save it, this one, we should be able to see. There we go, because we are the creator. Let's just position it a bit better by giving this div a class name equal to absolute 
right dash two, top dash two, flex, flex dash call, gap of four, rounded dash XL, BG dash white, P dash three, shadow dash SM, and transition dash all. That's going to move it to the top right. Also, there should be a little delete confirmation that pops up in case we want to delete it. And for that, we're going to create a new component right below this link called delete confirmation. So let's go to shared components and create a component called delete confirmation dot TSX, where we can run RAFCE and simply call it right here by running delete confirmation and importing it from that slash delete confirmation. And the only thing we have to pass is the event ID equal to event dot underscore ID. Now, if we go into it, we can start implementing it. And this component is just using a simple chat CN alert dialogue, which we have used before, if you remember, when creating the category on the event create page. For that reason, just to save us some time from writing the same code, I'm going to provide you the code for the delete confirmation in the readme down below. Find it and paste it right here. Then it should look something like this. We're using a lot of these different alert dialog options. And we're doing the same thing as before with the alert dialog trigger. We're asking, are we sure we want to delete? And then on click, we're calling the delete event option. Here we can say deleting. Now you're going to notice that if we save it, there's one thing that's not imported right here, which is the delete event server action. It's saying that we have it right here, but we haven't yet created it. And creating this delete event action cannot be any simpler. Let's start by copying our get event by ID and pasting it below. By now you should already get a good idea of how we create these actions because they all follow a similar pattern. We first create and export a basic async function. We give it a name of delete event. Here we can accept some props such as event ID or path if needed. And then we can define the type for those called delete event params. We connect to the database or we handle some errors. And after we're connected to the database, we try to do something with it. And that is either fetch some data, which is what we're doing here, or delete something by calling the event dot find by ID and delete to which we have to pass the event ID. Now we are not getting back the event. We're getting back the deleted event. And we can say, if there is a deleted event, then we want to revalidate a path. This means that we want to clear the cache and refetch all the events because the events structure has changed. And we don't need to return anything in this case. Simple as that. And I can notice we also have some errors right here on our right side. We're going to fix that soon. But I want to say, I hope by now you get the idea of writing these server actions and why they're so useful. It's because you can write basic JavaScript code, async functions, and then have proper try and catch error handling and immediately interact with the database and then simply call those actions right here within your code. Throughout building the rest of this video, there's going to be a few more actions which we'll have to create. But since procedure is the same, I want to give you the entire event.actions.ts file. So go to the same readme where you used to copy the code from before and just paste it right here. It's going to contain a couple more actions like get related events by category. We're going to also have get events by user. We have the get all events, which we have done already, but here we added the conditions. We also have the delete. We have the update, get event by ID, create event, and finally the helper functions. I hope you can notice the structure and the way in which we're creating these actions and using them within our code. And don't worry, whenever I use some of these actions in the future code, we're going to go over it, expand our action, and we're going to go through the functionality together. 
Now, with that said, let's close our event actions and let's figure out why this error is occurring. Unsupported server component type undefined. If we go back to the card, it looks like we're importing the lead confirmation, but we should be importing it not as a default component, but rather as a named import. So just delete the import and import it once again. When you do that and you go back, you can now see both delete and edit. And delete opens up this nice looking dialogue. And let's check out if the edit button works. Right now, it's going to point us to a 404, which means that our edit route has not properly been set up. And to set it up, let's see what we have done so far. We did have the update page, if I remember correctly, but it is under the create folder, which doesn't make too much sense. So this update folder should have been within the ID because we need to know which page or which post or which event are we updating. So as soon as I move it here, if we click edit right here, you can notice that now it points to our form that we created, but it says update event instead of create event, which is great. I told you we'll be able to reuse this component and now is the time. But of course, if you're updating an event, we don't want you to retype everything from scratch, do we? We want the program to autofill all the data and for you to change what you need to change. Only that and nothing more. So let's quickly close all of the currently open files and let's go to our event form. Let's figure out how we can not only implement the create, but also edit. And of course, autofill all the default values that already belong to this now already existing event. To do just that, we have to head to our update page, which is going to be a page under update ID right here. And this time, opposed to passing just the create type, we want to pass the existing event that we want to update. And to do that, we can fetch the event because now we have the get event by ID action, which we created for the event details page, and we can reuse it here. Another benefit of using server actions. We can do that by saying const event is equal to await get event by ID. And now we can pass the event ID, which is coming through params. If you notice right here at the top, we see event and then an ID, and we get access to it by destructuring params and then destructuring the ID from those params. And that's of a type update event params. We also have to make this async because we're using a wait. And now we get an event that we can simply pass over right here. Event is equal to event. Now to update our event, we also need to figure out who is updating it. And I believe we have done this already for the create page. Let me see. There we go. The way we did it is we got the user ID from session claims. So we can do the same exact thing here. Let's copy it. Let's put it right here. Import auth from clerk next JS. And then we get the user ID. Finally, we can pass it right here by saying user ID is equal to user ID. Now that works, but it's complaining about params a bit saying that property params does not exist on type update event params. That's because this was supposed to be update event props, not params, which we have to define right here, type update event props, where we get params with an ID of string. But still, our TypeScript is complaining about the event we're passing in. It's saying that type update and event is not assignable to intrinsic attributes event form props. Interesting. Let's dive into the event form and figure out why that is the case. Yes, of course. That's the case because so far we have never passed an actual event into the form before. We have been just creating new events, but now we're passing the event and we can also pass the event ID equal to event dot underscore ID. Now we're passing everything we need to update our form or rather update our event. So let's go into the form and accept all of those new props by saying event and event 
ID, where the event is going to be an optional prop because we're not passing it with the create form. It's going to be of a type I event, which we have to import, and event ID, which is also optional, of a type string. And now nobody is complaining and it's looking good. So finally, let's utilize those existing event values to fill in our fields. We can do that by setting the initial values right here. See that initial values are equal to event default values, but we can check if we have access to the event and if the type is triple equal to update. In that case, we can return an object that looks like this. Within this object, we can define all of the properties of an event. Or rather, even more simply, we can just set it to be an event. Let's put this in a new line so it's easier to understand. And let's save it. If you save and reload, you can see that we have invalid time value. That's because we have to wrap the start and end date time into new dates. So instead of passing the entire event, we can pass the event, but then update the start date time to be equal to new date and then pass the event start time and do the same exact thing with the end date time where we wrap it in a new date constructor like so. So now if we save it, you can see all of our values are pre-filled. We are allowed to change them. For example, GitHub Universe 2024. We can even change the category. Maybe this time we fully want to spell out artificial intelligence and click add. That works. And let's say that the first event was amazing. So the price increased to something like 999 bucks. And of course, this would also have to be 2024. So let's modify the year. Now, before we click update, we have to notice that this is not going to work. Why is that? Well, because the type is equal to update. And here in the submit, we are checking if the type is equal to create, but we have no check if the type is equal to update. So let's do that right away. We can do that by first duplicating the create right below, collapsing it, and then say if type is triple equal to update, we first want to check if we have an event ID, or rather check if we don't have it. So if there is no event ID, in that case, we can call a router dot back to go to the previous page and just exit out of the function. If we do have an event ID, on the other hand, we want to call the update event, which we have to import from lib actions, say updated event. The first parameter we pass is going to be the user ID. The second one is the event itself, where we spread out all the values we pass the updated image URL. And also we need to pass the underscore ID, which is the actual event ID. Finally, the path to revalidate is not profile because after update, we don't go to the profile. We go to the event detail page. So we have to say event ID. And this is of course going to be dynamic. Finally, if we do have an updated event, we want to reset our form and push to forward slash events, and then updated event dot ID. And now we need to reload the page and click update. If that happens, we have new values, but just to be sure, let's reload. And there we go, they remain, which means that they have been saved to the database. This is great. Everything is starting to make a lot of sense our beautiful homepage where now we can see the events. By the way, this is not looking too good. We have to make sure that this extends in one line. Then we have the update form where we can update the event or even create a new event. Then we have the dialogue for the deletion. And then we have this beautiful details page. Everything is looking better and better. And don't forget, we have phenomenal account management using Clerk. 
Now let's quickly fix this up because on the final version, even if we have something longer, it should fit in one line. I think this is the best place to use Tailwind's line clamp. So let's simply search for it. That's going to be within the card component where we are rendering the category, which should be right here. And we can give it a class name of line dash clamp dash one. If we save it, it's going to make it fit in one line. So this is looking great. Now, just to verify that our collection is working, let's go ahead and add a second event. It's better to have more. Let's copy one of the events from here, such as this one, JSM Nexus. But I'm going to name it as a real event. I'm going to name it Ultimate Next 14 Workshop. This is a special workshop we're doing for people that have purchased the Ultimate Next 14 course. We're going to dive deep into server actions and everything else you need to know to become a top 1% Next.js developer. Of course, this is going to be related to Next.js. To get the description, we can go to the real event page, Next.js for developers, because this indeed is a real event that I'm holding as a part of React Day Berlin 2023 workshop. It's an advanced Next.js workshop where we dive into topics that empower React.js developers to get the full power of Next.js. React server components, Edge and Node.js runtimes, server-side rendering, caching strategies, a lot of advanced stuff. So let's copy this. That's looking good. And let me use this photo right here. Let's also add a real link. I'm going to add a link to our course page. The date is going to be really soon. Let's add it somewhere around here. Make sure that it is in the future. The URL can be here as well. And in this case, let's make it free. Finally, let's create the event. Oh, there we go. Our Zod validation is working. The description must be less than 400 characters. So let's try to cutting it up a bit. We still have two more. Looks like there's a lot of things we want to cover. Let's just cut the last one out and a bit more. And there we go. We're good. I always try to cover as much as possible with every single workshop, video, or course we make. We got redirected back to this details page, which is looking good, but is it looking the same as in this one? It seems like it's cutting it here, but it's not that it's being cut. It's that we are yet to implement the related events functionality, which right now is going to be super simple because we already have the actions for it. And we already have created this collections component where it simply shows all the other events. So with that said, let's implement the get related events. We can close all of the files we have currently open and we can go to the details page, which is going to be under ID. So that's specifically events ID. And remember somewhere here at the bottom, we have specified that we have to add the recommended events. That's right here below the section. That means that we have to wrap the entire thing in a React fragment. So let's wrap it. And let's also close it properly at the end and add a new section for our recommended posts. This section is going to have a class name equal to wrapper, margin Y of eight to create some spacing, flex, flex dash call, gap of eight, and then medium devices gap of 12. When I say related, in this case, we can call it something like events from the same organizer. That's the idea. So let's add an H2, give it a class name equal to H2 dash bold, and say something like related events. We can go back to the home page and copy this collection that I have created and paste it right here below the H2. First, we have to import collection from components shared collection. And then instead of events, we have to pass related events, which we can fetch right here at the top of our page. So at the top, let's simply say const related events is equal to await 
get related events by category. And in there, we have to pass the category ID of a event dot category dot underscore ID. We can pass the event ID as well. As I said, we can compare based off of the category or the organizer, and then also the page, which is going to be coming from search params. So here we can say search params. And if we are on a specific page, we can say search params dot page as string. So the pagination will be working soon flawlessly as well. That's going to give us access to related events, which now we can pass right here, related events dot data. If we save it, you can see that we see no events. That's because we have no other events with the category next JS. I made a mistake here. It's not events from the same organizer. It's the events with the same category. In case you want to modify it, just go to this action and try to implement from the same organizer. In this case, I'm going to keep the same category because it makes more sense. But just to test it out, let's try to modify the category of one of our existing events. For example, the GitHub universe, go here, or rather let's go here and edit. And let's change it to Next.js, update. And there we go, the related events appears, and we can now navigate between those related events. Please tell me, is this not the best thing ever? When you form a couple of routes, and when you allow those routes to just navigate one to another. That way, it feels that your app is much more functional because you have the home page, you have here, you go here. It feels that you can just keep going and explore this great application. So what do you say? What is the next thing that we can implement? Well, I believe that my profile is waiting for us. Let's turn this 404 into a page. And we can do that by going all the way here and creating a new route using Next.js file-based routing. That's going to be under root, create a new folder called profile. And then within it, create a new page.tsx. And for now, just run RAFCE and say profile page. If we do that, you can now see a great looking profile page. Believe it or not, building out the profile page will be much easier than what you might think. Here, we're going to show my tickets. And then below, we're going to show my events organized, which is all the same thing. We're going to reuse the same collection component. Yep, that's right. But we're going to feed it different data. Below is going to be the data for the events we have organized. And above is going to be the collection for the events that we have purchased. So with that in mind, let's go all the way back here and let's start implementing the profile page. To implement our profile page, we can get started by wrapping everything in a React fragment. And that's because our profile page is going to consist of a couple of different things, two to be specific. The My Tickets, which you can write right here, My Tickets. And then below it, we're going to have something known as events organized. So these are the events that we as the user have organized. Let's start with the first section, which is my tickets, which is going to be a section that's going to have a class name equal to bg primary 50 bg dotted pattern bg cover bg center padding y of five, and on median devices, padding y of 10. That's going to give it this background where we can enter some text. But before that, let's create another div that's going to have a class name equal to wrapper, flex, items dash center, justify dash center, on small devices, justify dash between. Right in there, we want to show our H3. This H3 is going to say my tickets. And we can give it a class name equal to H3 bold 
text dash center, and on small devices, text dash left. There we go, that's looking good. Right below it, we can render a button, which we can import from components UI button. It's going to say as child, because we're gonna display a link as a child property, a link imported from next link, that's going to say, explore more events. And it's going to point to forward slash hash events. There we go. Now let's style it a bit by giving this button a class name equal to button, hidden, and on small devices, flex. So we don't have to show it on mobile, but if we grow larger, we can show it on the right side. Right below this section, we wanna have another section that's going to have a class name equal to wrapper margin Y of eight. And here we wanna render a collection. So let's copy the collection we have in our homepage, which is right here. And let's paste it there within the section. First, we need to import the collection from components shared collection. We're gonna keep the events empty for now. This is going to break our app, but we're fine with that. We wanna change the empty title to no event tickets purchased yet. Empty state is going to be something like no worries. Plenty of exciting events to explore. And this is going to not be all events collection type, it's going to be my underscore tickets type. The limit is going to be only three. The existing page will modify later. The URL per RAM name is equal to orders page. And the total pages we can modify later. Now, the next thing I want to do is just comment out this entire section entirely. So now we can see our website again. And I want to copy this entire initial section we have created and paste it below this section under events organized. Everything is going to be the same. We're gonna have a section, a div, and then an H3 that's going to say events organized. The link is going to point to create new event and we can change the link to point to forward slash events, forward slash create. And here we wanna render again a section where we can map over our collection. So below this section, we paste yet another section where this time we're going to say something like no events have been created yet. And we can say, go create some now. There we go. This is going to be events underscore organized. Limit is going to be six. Page is going to be one for now. And URL params is events page. There we go. So now we have the boilerplate structure set up, but what we have to do is fetch the events, both for my tickets and events organized. We haven't yet implemented the functionality to purchase or buy the tickets for specific events. So let's skip the my tickets for now, but let's make the events organized work because that's simple. We just have to figure out who is the creator of these events and then fetch it. We already know how to get the ID of a specific user. We have to say const session claims is equal to auth like this, which we import from clerk next.js. And then we say const user ID is equal to session claims question mark dot user ID as string. Finally, we can fetch organized events by saying const organized events is equal to await. We have to make this async, of course. That's going to be get events by user, which we need to import from actions. And to it, we can pass a user ID and a page, which for now can be set to one. So now we have the organized events and let's actually bring back the collection and pass the organized events data.
And this is the only thing it takes to actually show our cards. This is great. And considering that we're on the profile page, you can also see that now the order details appear. But we do have three errors though. It says hydration failed because the initial UI does not match what was rendered on the server. Expected server HTML to contain a matching div in an anchor tag. Okay, this means that some anchor tags are not working as they should be. It could be these two links. We have a button that has as child property. We can also give it the size of LG. I think it is a bit too small if we notice it right here. That's a bit bigger. And then it has a class name of button hidden on small devices flex. Within it, we have a link pointing to forward slash events forward slash create. This is good. Let's look into the other button above. This one also can have a size equal to LG. And the link is pointing to forward slash hash events. So if we reload, once again, we get those same errors. It is a hydration error, the most common error in Next.js. And if you click right here, you can see that the React hydration error most commonly happens if you do incorrect nesting of HTML tags, such as putting a P instead of a P, a div instead of a P, or so on. So to fix it, let's go to our collection and let's navigate to our card right here. You're gonna notice that here we have a div that's wrapping our link. And if you scroll a bit down, you can see that this link is wrapping many different things such as P tags and more. What we wanna do is remove the href from this link and simply make it a div. There we go. So now it's a div with this class name. Now, of course, we have to bring back that link somewhere. So we can bring it back once we click on the event title, which is going to be right here. There we go, we have a P tag, and we can wrap that P tag inside of a link. So we can do a link, put this P tag inside of it, and then give this link an href of forward slash events, forward slash event dot underscore ID. Now, if we save it, now we of course have to close the div tag as well and not have it named link. But if we did that and go back, you're gonna notice that the error is gone. And if you click on a link, it still points to the correct page. So this is great, we no longer have errors. Now, if we close all of these pages and get back to where we were, we have successfully implemented the half of the profile page where we have the events organized. But now is the time that we dive into the entire ticketing system of our application, a completely new functionality. We don't yet have these order details. As you can see, orders page is empty. And we don't yet have the ability to purchase somebody else's tickets. So if we go right here to the deployed evently and check out a specific event, such as this one, we can see that we can also make the tickets unavailable. But in case they are available, we can click buy a ticket. And then we're gonna be greeted with this entire mobile responsive Stripe interface where we can purchase it. And then once we purchase it, which we can do by typing just the default Stripe card, let's do that right here. And enter my name, such as JS Mastery. And we also have to do email, click pay. You can notice that now we have two tickets. But the real magic happens once you are the organizer and somebody else purchases your ticket, because then you have access to the completely different UI where you can see the emails of all of the people that have purchased your events. So for that reason, let's go ahead and get started with implementing this entire buy ticket functionality. We can do that by going back to our homepage and then clicking on a specific event that we didn't create. In this case, I'm logged in with JS Mastery, Adrian JS Mastery, and this event was created by Adrian JS Mastery. So what I need to do now to be able to purchase the ticket is to log in with a different account. So I'm gonna sign out and I'm gonna log in again. This time I did it with my other JavaScript Mastery email. 
And if I go here, now since we're a guest and not a creator, you can see that by the name that we have right here, we should be able to see a buy now button. So let's head to the details page, which is this events ID page. Let's scroll up all the way where we have a comment that we added for ourselves that says checkout button. Inside of here, we're going to make a call to our own component. So let's create it. New file called checkout button.tsx, where we can for now run RAFCE. We can immediately use that button right here by calling it as a self closing component, checkout button, and deporting it at the top. We're going to pass one thing to it. We're going to pass the entire event so we know what we are buying. Of course, we have to go into the checkout button component and accept that event right away by saying event is of a type event I event as in interface event. There we go. We can also immediately figure out if the event has been completed. Has it been closed? And we can do that by saying const closed event is equal to new date event dot start date time is lower than new date. Or we can also use end date time because we can maybe still participate if it hasn't ended. If that is the case, the event has closed. So a better name for this variable would be has event finished. There we go. Also, we need to know who is purchasing the event. So let's immediately get access to the user. Now, in this case, we won't use the claims to get the user ID to know who is purchasing it because this button is going to be a client component. So we can immediately define it as client or rather use client and we can use the const user is equal to use user coming from clerk next JS. That's going to give us access to the user ID by saying const user ID is equal to user question mark dot public metadata dot user ID as string. There we go. Now we have everything we need to create this button. So let's first wrap everything in a div that's going to have a class name equal to flex items dash center and a gap of three. Right within it, we're going to say that we cannot buy past events. So here we can add a check doing something like if has event finished. In that case, we can render a P tag saying, sorry, tickets are no longer available. There we go. And else what we can do is just render the button. So for now, let's wrap it in an empty react fragment and say button. Now, if we save this, you can see checkout button. And now it's going to say button. I also noticed they have this C right here. So let's quickly remove it. There we go. And in this case, looks like the event is not in the past because we are right here seeing the button and not seeing this P tag. Still, let's just style it by giving it a class name of P-2 and text-red-400. Great. Now to purchase an event, we need to be logged in which is once again, where clerk comes to be really handy. We can use their signed out component to figure out if the user is signed out. In that case, we can render a button. And of course we have to import this from clerk next JS. And then this button is going to render a link. And that link is going to have an href pointing to forward slash sign in. And it's going to say, get tickets. Of course, we have to import the link from next link and the button from UI button. Since the button is rendering a link, it can have the as child property and a class name equal to button rounded dash full. And also it can have a size of LG. Now, if we save it, we cannot see anything yet because we are signed in. So let's render some code if we are signed in. In that case, we can use another one of the clerk utility components called signed in, 
which we can import from Clerk Next.js. And there, if we are signed in, we're going to render another component of ours where we're going to have the entire checkout. So let's call it checkout.tsx, run RAFCE, and then simply call it right here, checkout. And to that checkout, we want to pass the entire event. And we also want to pass the user ID equal to user ID so we know who is checking out. So now if we go to checkout, or just if we save this. So now if we import checkout from that slash checkout, you can see it right here. And if I open this page in the incognito mode, you can see that now we're not logged in, but we can still see the event. We can still see the homepage and everything, but we need to log in to be able to purchase it, which is amazing. But if we already are logged in, in that case, we can just see the checkout. So let's head to the checkout and let's implement it. The checkout is also going to start with a button, but it's going to utilize Stripe functionalities. So let's create it as a form that's going to have an action equal to on checkout. And this on checkout is a function that we have to create by saying const on checkout is equal to an async callback function where for now we can simply console log checkout. There we go. And we can also do it as a method is equal to post. Now that we have a form, we can have a button within it. And that button has to be imported from UI button. Now this button needs to know whether to say buy event or get event for free. So let's first get all the event information from props by defining it right here, event and user ID is of types. Event is I event, user ID is string. And we have to import I event from database models. Now this button can say if event that is free, then we can say something like get ticket else we can say buy ticket. There we go. If we save it, in this case, you can see get ticket because this one is free. But if we go back and head to our GitHub universe, you can see in this case, it says buy ticket because this one has a price. Let's also give it a type equal to submit, a role equal to link because it's going to link us to the checkout, a size of LG, and a class name equal to button on small devices, W dash fit. There we go. That's more like it. Now, the last thing we have to do is bring Stripe into the picture. To start setting up Stripe, you can go to stripe.com and then click sign in or start now. Once you're in, you'll be redirected to your dashboard. What's really important is for you to turn on the test mode. So this toggle has to be on because right now we're testing our application and not publishing it in a real environment. Once you're here, you can then visit this Stripe documentation page. It's going to be in the same readme where you found all of the other code blocks. I gotta say Stripe has by far one of the best documentation pages out there. Everything is nicely sorted out. They have different examples and every single example has a full app as well as instructions, and then also the full code block. And if you go over the steps, you can see exactly what each part of the code does. Not to mention that they have specific React and also Next.js documentation pages, which is amazing. So with that said, let's implement it. We're going to set up a checkout component. First, we have this pages index.js. In our case, that's going to be our checkout page. And we have already done most of this. If you think about it, we have a button, but the last thing we need is to actually load up Stripe. So let's import these few first lines right here, and we can paste it right here. So we have the load Stripe and then Stripe promise. We also need this use effect so we can put it right here in our component. So once we are redirected, this is going to check what's happening. Is it a success? or is it canceled? So let's just import use effect right from the top coming from React. 
And finally, we have a checkout button, which we have already added. Here, we can see that we're calling the next public Stripe publishable key, and we didn't yet add that to our ENVs. So here, if you click ENV, you'll get everything you need to copy with your exact keys being pulled from your dashboard. So let's simply copy this, go to our .env.local, and paste it below. Also, later on, we'll have to set up our Stripe webhook secret. We're going to do that soon. For now, it's important that we have these two. Now, the next thing we have to do is we have to install Stripe at Stripe.js. So let's simply copy this. And then in our other terminal, run npm install, and then paste at Stripe forward slash Stripe-js. That's going to give us all the imports we need. And we are going to have our own Stripe promise. There we go. It got installed and no longer do we have an error. Here, it's complaining that maybe this is not going to be there. So just to remove that TypeScript error, we can add an exclamation mark at the end. And I don't believe we'll need to use this Stripe promise. We're just setting it up. So we simply need to call load Stripe once. There we go. Now, the most important thing is what's going to happen once we actually check out. And we can deal with that right here on the on checkout function. Here, we want to form our order by saying const order is equal to an object where we have the event title equal to event dot title, event ID equal to event dot underscore ID, price equal to event dot price, is free equal to event dot is free, and buyer ID equal to the user ID. Now that we have this order, we need to pass it into a new server action we are about to create. So let's say await checkout order to which we're going to pass the order. This checkout order, as I said, is going to be a server action right here within the lib actions. And we're going to create a new file called order.actions.ts. We can immediately make it a use server. And you already know the drill. We have to run export const checkout order is equal to an async function that accepts the order of a type checkout order params. And here we can have a try and catch block. In the error, we can simply throw the error. And we have to fill this in to make it an error function. And then here we can start processing our Stripe payment. Before that, let's just import this checkout order within our checkout. There we go. And we just need to ensure that the order has everything it needs to have. Right now, it looks like it doesn't. So if I go back here, we need to make sure that this is checkout order params, which it is. And that means that we need event title, ID, price is free, and the buyer ID. And what are we passing? It says that the types of property price are incompatible. So let's check out what our I event is saying. It's saying that the price can be optional, but it cannot. We need to have it even if an event is free. So if we fix this, now it's not going to complain about the price that we're passing through. Now let's form this order action. The code for that is going to be right here. We need to create a new Stripe session. And we essentially can copy everything that is within this try block right here. There we go. So let's copy it and paste it right here. We're creating a Stripe session. But before we do that, we have to load Stripe up by using this line right here, which we can put right here at the top of the try. It's going to say const Stripe is equal to new Stripe like this, to which we pass the process.env that Stripe secret key. And Stripe has to just be imported from Stripe. So let's run npm install Stripe. There we go. And then we'll be able to import this constructor right here at the top. And then once this is installed, we can import the Stripe constructor at the top. Let's see, import Stripe coming from Stripe. 
There we go. Here we also need to add that exclamation mark. Now we have our Stripe instance. Let's also form the price by saying const price is equal to if order dot is free, then the price is a number zero. Else we turn the order price into a number and multiply it by 100 because I believe Stripe is taking in the price in cents. So now we have the Stripe instance, we have the price, and we have everything we need to create a session. So to our session, we can provide the line items we want to purchase. And we can do that by deleting what we have here. And instead saying price underscore data, where the currency is equal to USD, the unit amount is equal to price, the product underscore data is equal to name order dot event title. And finally, right below, we can provide a quantity of one. Finally, we need to provide some metadata that we want to pass over, such as the event ID is equal to order dot event ID, and the buyer ID is equal to order dot buyer ID. Mode is going to be payment. We don't need the automatic tax, but we're going to keep the success URL and the cancel URL. Now let's see what is our TypeScript complaining about. It says that the currency, which I misspelled, does not exist in type price data. Here we go. How useful it is to have TypeScript be here and tell you you misspelled your variable wrong. If I spell it correctly, it looks good. Also, we need to add a comma right here. And then we need to fix our URL. We can do that by instead of calling reg.headers.origin, we can call the process dot env dot next underscore public underscore server underscore URL. If we succeed, we're going to point to forward slash profile. And if we don't succeed, we're going to point to just forward slash. There we go. Finally, we want to redirect to the session dot URL like this. And this redirect is coming from next navigation. This is how we initialize a Stripe checkout order. But we're not done yet. Let's close all of the currently open files and let's go back to checkout. Let's also go to our mobile mode and open up localhost 3000. Here, it looks like I misspelled use server. So let's fix that. That's going to be in the order that actions. That's use server. We're back. And now on the checkout, once we try to check out, it's going to call the server action and trigger the Stripe initiate checkout. So let's give it a shot. Let's click the button. If I click it, I get invalid URL undefined forward slash profile, it must begin with HTTP or HTTPS. So remember how when in the checkout order, we used this next public server URL, we have to define it. So if we go back right here to .env.local, we can define a new variable, next public server URL, and for now, we can make it localhost. If I save it, reload this page, and then click buy ticket, you can see that we are redirected to the best in class worldwide checkout. Now there's still a couple of steps we have to do before we can proceed with our payment. Because we don't only want to process our payments, we also want to store the information about the order within our database. That way we'll be able to retrieve it. And on the profile page, show the user all of the different orders or tickets that they have purchased like this. So how do we do that? Well, we're diving a bit deeper than what usual YouTube videos dive into when it comes to Stripe. We're going to use Stripe webhooks. Similar to how we use clerk webhooks, Stripe webhooks are going to trigger once the checkout has succeeded or failed. That's going to allow us to do some action such as create an order in the database once we actually purchase the ticket. So let's go back to Stripe dashboard. Let's expand it. Let's go to developers, then go to webhooks. As you can see, we have a nice looking representation of what happens. 
our webhook is going to let us know when something happens and then you can do something in your own database. We want to add an endpoint. And here we have to enter the endpoint URL, similar to what we had to do for Clerk. Thankfully, we have already deployed our app. So go back to Vercel, find your project and click visit. This is the old deployment we have published before. The only thing we need is the URL. So copy it, go back to Stripe dashboard, enter the endpoint, and then do forward slash API, forward slash webhook, forward slash Stripe. This is where we're gonna add our webhook within our application. Then you can select events you wanna listen to, and we wanna subscribe only to one event. Check out dot session dot completed. Okay, and then click add events. Once again, Stripe documentation conveniently gives you different code bases. We can go for Node.js and here you get the entire file, which you can simply copy and then click add endpoint. It's enabled. And then here we need a signing secret, but before let's paste what we copied before. Back in our app, we can close all of our files and go to app, API, webhook, and create a new folder called Stripe. And there create a new route.ts. Now the code that they provided us right here that we copied is code for a Node.js server. We wanna modify this to suit our needs. But before we do that, let's get our webhook secret by clicking reveal and then copying it. Now we can go back to the .env.local and we can add it right here, Stripe webhook secret. There we go. That's looking good to me. But now we have to update this route TS to modify it from a Node.js server to a Next.js route. Similarly to what we did for Clerk, I'm gonna provide you with the code for this route Stripe webhook so you can simply copy it and paste it here. And once you do, let's go ahead and look into it together. We are importing Stripe as well as next server, and then a special new action, which we will together create. This is going to be an action that's going to turn a Stripe successful checkout order into a document in our database. Then we have a post request right here, which is going to be triggered by the webhook. That's the beauty of it. So as soon as the order is completed, Stripe is going to ping our endpoint and provide us all the information within this body right here, which is equal to request.txt. We get the signature for Stripe as per their documentation. We have the secret. And then the most important part is that we listen for a specific event type. If event type is equal to checkout.session.completed, we form this event data object with all of the order information and we simply pass it into the create order action, which we're about to create. So let's do that right away by going to lib actions order action and create a new export const create order is equal to an async function that accepts an order of a type create order param, which has to be imported from types. Then we open up a new try and catch block. In the catch, we try to handle the error by importing the utils handle error functionality. And in the try, we're trying to modify the database. So we have to await connect to database, which we have to import from dot dot slash database. Then we want to form a new order by saying const new order is equal to await order dot create like this. And this order has to be imported from our database models. To that order, we spread the entire order coming from params and we pass the event equal to order dot event ID as well as the buyer equal to order dot buyer ID. And finally, once we create the order, we want to return JSON dot parse and JSON that stringify new order. Great. So now once this webhook triggers, 
we will create a new instance of an order in the database. Now to fully test all of this out, what we have to do is push this code to Vercel so that we actually expose this endpoint to be pinged by Stripe's webhook. So to do that, let's first copy all of this new environment variables that we have created, which I believe are these ones right here. And let's push this code to GitHub by running git add git commit dash m implement stripe and then git push. This is going to trigger another redeployment and we can go back to Vercel. Notice that redeployment is in progress or at least queued. But what we should have done before is go to settings, environment variables, and then we need to paste all of these new environment variables right here and click save. Now, if we go back and reload, this deployment is being queued. So let's give it a minute. And once it builds, I want to redeploy it anyway, one more time to ensure that our environment variables we just added are taken into account. So let's wait until this is done. And then we can check out our project. And there we go, we are ready. I'm going to go back to our application right here, or rather to project, and then click visit. This is going to give us just the plain URL, which we deployed our app on. And here we can see our two events. That's great. Now we can test out our webhook and see if it's triggered once we actually complete our order. So we can do that either on the deployed website, or we can do it on our local host. Let's try to do it on our local host for now, because that's how we have been testing this entire time. I'm back on localhost 3000 forward slash events on the GitHub universe event, and I'm going to click buy ticket. I get redirected to Stripe. I can enter my email and just enter 4242 and keep typing that out until the end. This is the default demo Stripe card and click pay. Once this happens, we should be redirected. So let's see if that happens. We are redirected back to the profile. And now if we go to our webhook, let's see if an event is going to get triggered. It still says waiting for events. If I reload, we have one completed checkout session complete. This is great. So that means that our event in the database should have been created as well. Of course, to check that out, we can either go to our MongoDB Atlas and to see it there, or we can create a server action within orders right here to fetch all of our orders. So let's try to do just that. The code for this is not hard, but it is a bit lengthy. So down in the description in the readme, you can find the last remaining two server actions. You can copy them and then paste them here. Once you copy them, you'll notice a couple of errors. First, for this orders, we have to import the event from database models event model. We also need to import this type. And for the above one, we have to import the type as well. And we have to import the object ID coming from MongoDB by saying import object ID from MongoDB. And we have to put it in braces. There we go. And finally, there is one last error here saying that we need to import the user model as well. Now I know that was a lot of code, but let me explain it all right away. We have two separate server actions. One is to get orders by event. And the other one is to get orders by user. We're going to use the get orders by user when we want to display the tickets that a specific user has bought on their profile. And we're going to use the get orders by event when the organizer wants to see how many tickets have been sold for a specific event. So let's first start with the get orders by ID. We connect to the database. We implement pagination more on that later. We set the conditions where the buyer is the user ID. We get the distinct event ID, and then we find it based off of the conditions, which is that the buyer has to be this specific user. We sort it by the newest buys, we skip it for pagination, and we populate all the event information. Finally, we return that data back. So let's actually put this to use. 
by going back all the way to the profile page. Remember, we got the events that we have organized, but we haven't yet implemented the collection where we can see which tickets have we purchased. So right at the top of this page, we can call the const orders is equal to await get orders by user. We need to pass in the user ID as well as the page, which for now we can set to one. We need to import it from actions and then we can map over those orders by only get the event information. So const ordered events is equal to orders question mark dot data dot map, where we get each individual order of a type I order, which we need to import from models order. And for each one, we simply return the order dot event, or it's going to be an empty array. There we go. This now allows us to map over our orders by uncommenting this entire section and passing the ordered events dot data right in here. If we save that, you can see that we cannot read properties of data.length in the collection. So apparently the data that is coming right here is incorrect. What we can do is just console log the ordered events so we can see what we're getting. Let's console log and save it. And then we can open up the terminal. And it appears that we do get some data. Ordered events is an array of different events. That looks good to me. So let's see why in the collection we have an error. If we go right here, we're passing the ordered events that data. Oh, I don't think we have to do data anymore. It is just ordered events because we have already mapped over them right here on the top. So if we now save it, there we go. We have one event bot. Keep in mind, I'm on my different account right now. So we don't have any events organized, but we have tickets that we have purchased. That is amazing. Now the way in which we're going to make the pagination work is by using the search params. Back in our deployed application on our profile, we don't really have the pagination. But if we had more events created, we would be able to paginate using the URL query. Simply saying something like page, or rather question mark page, is equal to one, two, or three. So how do we implement that? Well, it's quite simple. We simply get access to the search params through props. And they're going to be of a type search param props. Once you get it, they're going to expose whatever you put in your URL. So we can say something like const orders page is equal to convert into a number, the search params question mark dot orders page or defaulted to one. And we can repeat the same procedure for the events page like this. And now instead of saying the default page right here for both of these is one, we can set the page to orders page is orders page and events page is events page. What that's going to do is it's going to send the correct page back to our server action so we can get it back. Similarly, the page we have to pass here is now going to be the orders page. And the total number of pages is going to be orders question mark dot total pages. And for our organized events, we want to pass the page of events page. And we want to pass the organized events question mark dot total pages. There we go. Now you can see this card on our profile is looking a bit empty, especially for the lower part. If I'm not mistaken, I believe we have left something out to do in the card. So if we go to a collection and if we go into a card here down below, we should be able to navigate to the order details. Oh, but that has order link is only going to be true if we are on the events organized, not my tickets bot. Yes, that's correct. So if we have organized the event, then we should be able to see who bought it. So I think this is the perfect time to navigate over to my second account, which is the organizer for this event. I'm going to log out and I sign back in with JS Mastery. 
Now, if I go back to my profile and if we expand it, and now for the events organized for GitHub Universe, we have the order details, which now points us to yet another page, which is the orders page. So let's go ahead and immediately create a route for that page by closing all of the currently open files, going to app root, create a new folder called orders, and then create a new file called page.tsx, inside of which we can run RAFCE and call it orders page. There we go. We can see a new page. How convenient is it with Next.js? And what we have to do here is just form a table of all of the orders that we have. This doesn't have to be anything special. We can use the default HTML5 table elements. Since this is more so coding out the layout, I don't want you to spend all the time writing out table rows and table headings. The code for this entire orders page is down below in the readme. So copy it and paste it right here. Once you paste it, if you save it, you're going to see that everything is going to work, but we need to create one incredibly important component, which we didn't do so far. And that is the search component, the same component that we also need to implement on our homepage. Yep. Now that we have more events, it's finally the time to implement the search and filtering, which is also going to be happening in the orders page. So just to see how our order page looks like, let's create a new shared component called search.tsx, run RAFCE, and right off the bat, if I replace this right here, you'll be able to see our profile page. There we go. So if I expand it, you can see that it is nothing more than a simple table where we can see the order ID, the event title, the buyer. And if you want to, you can also add a buyer email. So it's super convenient for you to just send them the access to the event created and the amount. You can think of this as the admin interface for our event management platform. But of course, what if we have many users here, which is often going to be the case. Let's say you are the admin of the event and you are at the entrance. People are coming with their tickets and giving you their emails or names, but you have to check each and every one of them in an instant. That's why we're going to implement search. So you can really easily search for their order ID or just their name or email. So to do it, we can now go back. And since we have more things to search and filter on our homepage, we can start implementing it here. So let's open up the homepage by going to pages and then root. And let's utilize our newly created search component by importing it from components shared search. And let's dive into it and start implementing it. To start with our search, we can first create a state field that's going to keep track of our search value. We can do that by creating a use state snippet and calling it query set query at the start set to an empty string. We need to import the use state from react. And since we are using states, that immediately means that this is a use client component. So we can say use client right at the top. Now that we have the query, let's wrap everything in a div and give it a class name equal to flex dash center min dash h dash 54 pixels w dash full overflow dash hidden rounded dash full bg dash gray dash 50 padding x of four and padding y of two. That's going to create an outline for our search within it. Let's show an image. This image will be imported from next image. And we can give it a source equal to forward slash assets, forward slash icons, forward slash search dot SVG. We can also give it an alt tag of search and we can give it a width and a height of 24 pixels. Now we have a nice looking search icon right below that image. Let's create an input field, which is going to be a self-closing input component imported from dot dot slash UI forward slash input. We can give it a type is equal to text as well as a placeholder 
equal to something like search for now. Finally, let's give it an on change property equal to where we check for the event and then set the query based off of the events e target value. Also, let's style it a bit better by giving it a class name p regular 16 border 0 bg gray of 50 outline offset 0 placeholder text gray 500 focus border 0 focus dash visible ring of 0 focus dash visible ring of offset 0 if we now save this it's going to make it look uniform with this div that we have and we can start typing within it that's great but now let's implement the functionality for our search we can do that by keeping track of our query within a use effect so let's create a new use effect hook where we have a callback action and it's going to be re-triggered every time that the query changes. Let's also import use effect from React. Now inside of here, we could immediately trigger our API and get all of the latest events matching our search filters. But that would result in so many unnecessary API calls. What we can do instead is create something known as a debounce function by saying const delay debounce fn. And this function is going to only trigger after a specific timeout. So we can say that's equal to set timeout with a callback function within it. And then the second parameter is the time in milliseconds on how long it will wait before it makes that API call. We can do something like 300 milliseconds. Then we can check if we have the query, we want to form a new URL based off of that query by saying const new URL is equal to form URL query. This is one of our utility functions to which we can pass params equal to. And now we have to be careful. We have to get the current existing value from the search. So let's set it to an empty string for now. And when we are in the search, once we modify it, we want to also modify our search query right here to say something like query is equal to test. So what is in here and what is in the URL has to be the same. So let's get access to this query from the URL by using the search params. We can do that by saying const search params is equal to use search params coming from next navigation. Now we can set our params to be equal to search params dot to string. We can also pass a key equal to query and the value equal to the value of the query. There we go. On the other hand, if we clear out this string, we want to remove that query from the top. So in that case, we can say else, we can form the same new URL by copying it, but we want to call remove keys from query from libutils. We want to pass the new search params, but we want to call keys to remove to be equal to an array of query. Then whatever new URL we have, we want to navigate to it by using the router functionality. So let's get the router at the top by saying const router is equal to use router coming from next navigation. We need to call it. And finally, we want to navigate to where we are by doing router.push or we push to a new URL and we can set the scroll to false to keep the current amount of scroll. Of course, now we're outside of this new URL. So let's define the new URL at the top equal to an empty string. And then we can just reset it in each one of these if and else statements. Finally, we have to clear this delay debounce function by calling return and then returning the clear timeout that has the delay debounce function declaration passed as a prop. And we want to recall this not only when the query changes, but also when the search params or the router change as well.
Great. So now check this out. If I start typing something here, like ASD, the query automatically changes to ASD. If I remove it, it's gone. If I type something like, let's search for ultimate, you can see it made only one request to ultimate. But if I slowly remove one by one, it's going to remove them one by one as well. So A, S, D, it updates only every 300 milliseconds, not to overload our API or our database. We can also accept a dynamic placeholder through props right here by saying placeholder. We can give it a default value of search title, dot, 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 which is going to be of a type placeholder, which is going to be optional and of a type string. And now we can use this placeholder right here dynamically to say search title. Now this by itself is not going to automatically filter our events. If I type universe, even though this changes, it doesn't filter out just the universe. So for this to take effect, we have to go back to our homepage. And here you can see that we're calling the get all events. So why don't we read this query from the URL now that this function is really conveniently setting it up for us? We can do that by getting access to search params, which is of a type search param props. Then we can set some variables right here at the top, such as getting the page number, which is equal to a number of search params question mark dot page or one. We also want to get the search text by saying const search text is equal to search params dot query as string or an empty string. And finally, we want to do the same thing for the category once we implement it in the future. Now we're getting all of these parameters, specifically the query from the URL, and we can read it and send it over to our get all events. So query is equal to search text category is equal to category, page is equal to page, and limit we can leave as six for now. It's complaining a bit about the category. That's just because I forgot a comma. So if I add it, it's good. We're passing the search text as query to get all events. And then get all events takes this title condition, does a regular expression on it, and simply passes it in the event.find, which then filters it out. And finally, if you type something out, you have boat, we have ultimate, and we have universe. And if I type just you, you're gonna have boat, but as soon as we dive deeper, it's gonna give you the one. So our search is now fully functional using the best practices of Next.js 14 server actions, as well as search params. Now let's also implement the category filter by scrolling a bit down and then creating a new category filter component within shared components dot TSX. We can run RAFCE and simply import the category filter right here, coming from components shared category filter. And then we can navigate to it. The category filter is going to work on the same principle as the search did, but it will use a select instead of an input. So let's find a shadcn select element right here in the documentation, install it if we haven't already, but I believe we did, and then import everything we need to make it happen right here. We can also just import the base use of the select component and paste it here. There we go. Now, if we save it and go back, you can see that now we have a nice looking filter but let's make it fit our needs. We're going to reference to a lot of the things that we used in the input because the principle is the same. So let's go to the search and let's copy everything above this bottom part, everything above JSX, the use effect, as well as all the states and just paste them right here in the category filter. We're going to also use the use router, which you can import. We're going to use the use state as well. We're going to also use the use router, which you can import from next navigation. Don't make a mistake and import from next router. We're going to import use state as well from react. 
we can import use search params, use effect as well, form URL query, and remove keys from query. There we go. And the only thing we have to change is from query to categories and from set query to set categories. And then in the use effect, we can use the categories right here. We're going to also create a new function called const on select category, which accepts only one param category of a type string. And then we can do some logic later on. But for now, let's fix this error. Since we're using the on select, the use effect and all the other things, we have to make this a use client. And also we have an error defining the query in the if right here, we can just change this over to we can just change this over to categories for now. There we go. And now we can make it look better by giving this select trigger a class name of select dash field. And the placeholder can be category. We can also on the select add the on value change equal to a callback function where we get the value of a type string. And we call the on select category to which we pass the value. Finally, we're not going to have light, dark and system. We're going to only keep the one default one, which is going to be all categories given a value of all and a class name equal to select dash item P dash regular dash 14. That's looking good. But now we want to map over all of the categories that exist in our database. For that, we're going to use the same function that we used when creating our categories. If you remember in the create event, here we make a call to get all the categories. So let's go to our event form and let's copy the part where we fetch all the categories. I believe that's in the special category component. Yep, that's the drop down component. And from here, we can copy the code for this entire use effect. Go back to our category filter and just paste it above our current use effect. Get categories is equal to category list, where we import this get all categories from the actions. And then we set the category list as I category, which we have to import from database models. And also we have to define the type of the categories to be equal to I category and an array right here. And this is also going to be an array. Now, if we reload the page, now, if we go back to home, you can see that we have an error happening. And once again, maybe our error handling is not doing the best job of properly displaying it, but we can see string value object object for value type array at path title for model event. It looks like we're not doing something well. Let's see. I'm going to comment out this entire use effect, which we brought from the query. It is most likely possible that it's messing with us right now. So I want to comment it out. And we still have that error. If we open up our console, it kind of points at home line 28. So let's see what's happening at line 28. It looks like we're passing the category right here. And let's see how the get all events is accepting it. So it's getting the category condition, get category by name, category or null, but it's looking only if it exists. So this shouldn't really matter. What I think could be messing with it is that in our category filter for a brief point in time, we had this and then it updated the wrong value of categories right here. And then it's messing with our query right now. So if you're still having this issue, just reset the query to be equal to an empty string and then it should be working or simply clear out the entire query at the top and then bring it back right here to search text. Now it's going to work. It's just that when we copy this use effect here, it caused some issues, but we're going to fix that soon. The most important thing right now is for us to get these categories right here, which are going to populate the categories. That now allows us to go back here below the select item all, and then map over the categories by calling the categories dot map 
where we get an individual category and immediately return a select item that renders the category.name. Each select item needs to have a value equal to category.name, a key equal to category dot underscore ID, and a class name equal to select dash item p dash regular dash 14. If we now save it, you can see we get all of our categories, which is great, but this is not yet affecting our search params. So to make that work, we have to pull some of the parts of our previous use effect into our on select category. Why did we have it in the use effect for the input, but we're going to have it in a function call for our select. That's because we had to listen for key presses in our input, but here we can do something whenever we click something, right? So let's simply pull the inner part of this, where we set the new URL all the way to router.push and copy that, delete the rest, and then paste what you copied here. First, we form a new URL. Then we check if category and category is not equal to all is true. If it is, we form a new URL with params to string where the key is category and value is category. Similarly, we want to remove the category from here in case we delete the category. So if you've done that, and if you select all, nothing will happen. But if you select Next.js, immediately a category of Next.js will be added, and you can switch between different ones. But only if you come back to all, all will be showing and nothing will be here. And if we go to AI, nothing or artificial intelligence, nothing. But if I go to Next.js, we have both of these here because they both have a tag of Next.js. This is phenomenal. And with that, we have completed the full search and filtering of our homepage. So let's close it, close all of the pages, and let's focus on adding the pagination. Yep, we're going to go that far as well. On top of search and filtering, we want to be able to paginate to improve the initial page load time. So to do that, just create a new shared component called pagination.tsx, where you can run RAFCE. And then we want to head over to our collection component. A collection is where we map over all of the elements. And we want to go right below the UL. So right before where we end all of our elements and check if total pages is greater than one, then we want to call our newly created pagination component. To that pagination, we want to pass the URL param name equal to URL param name, a page equal to page, and total pages equal to total pages. All of these are props that we're passing over right here to our collection component. So now we can import the pagination from that slash pagination, head into it, and accept all of these new exciting props that are going to allow us to make the pagination happen. So inside of here, we can get the page, total pages, as well as URL param name, which is going to be of a type pagination props, which we can define just above. The pagination props is going to be a type that's going to be an object where page is either a number or a string. Total pages is a number and URL param name is an optional string parameter. Now, believe it or not, the same principle on top of which we have built the search and filtering functionality, we're going to build the pagination on. We're going to use search params. So let's immediately get access to the router by saying const router is equal to use router coming from next navigation. And let's also get the search params which is equal to use search params coming from next navigation. Of course, since we have a hook, this has to be a use client component. We didn't have that many though, right? We had a lot of server side rendered pages, but only a few client side components, such as input, filter, and pagination. 
we're going to have a function called on click. So const on click, where we can get the access to the BTN type more than that soon of a type string, it's going to be either previous or next. And here we can do the logic. So let's create those two buttons that are going to form our pagination. Our div is going to have a class name equal to flex and a gap of two. And within it, we want to render a button that's going to say previous. It's going to be imported from UI button. And it's going to have a size equal to LG, a variant equal to outline, a class name equal to W28, an on click property calling the on click like this and passing prev as in previous, and then disabled if we are on a number page, if that is lower than or equal to one. That means that we cannot go previous. And we want to duplicate this button below. This one is going to go next. And we cannot go further if the number of pages is greater than or equal to total pages. If we save this, and also modify this text to say next, if we go down, you can see previous and next where we can go next. But right now, it's not going to work because we haven't yet hooked it up to our router. But hey, they at least appear right here at the bottom. So now on click, as I told you, we use the same exact principle to make it happen. First, we have to figure out do we go forward or do we go backwards. And we can do that by figuring out the page number we're going to be on once we do the change. So const page value is equal to if a BTN type is triple equal to next. In that case, it's going to be number of the page plus one. Else, it's going to be number of the page minus one. That's going to look like this. Once we have the page value, we form a new URL by saying const new URL is equal to form URL query coming from libutils, where we pass params equal to search params dot to string. We pass a key of URL param name or just a string of page. And we pass a value equal to page value dot to string. There we go. Finally, we use the router to call the router dot push navigate to this new URL and don't reset the scroll. So we can see scroll false. If we save this, and if we click next, you're going to notice we go onto the second page and the page says two. But something seems to be broken here. So let's just remove the entire query. And as you can see, this works. But it seems like we cannot go backwards right now. So maybe if we go to the collection, we have to properly set this up. If the total pages number is greater than one, then we have the pagination. But in this case, we have only two posts. So we shouldn't be seeing the pagination at all. So let's see why the total pages number is greater than one. That's coming all the way here to our homepage, I believe. Here, we're passing the collection. And we're saying, oh, the total pages is static right now set to two. I'm glad that it was set to that because that allowed us to see the pagination. But right now we have only two. So if we use the real value of events, question mark dot total pages, and pass the actual page right here, then it's going to disappear because the number of total pages is less than two. So this is exactly what we wanted. And with that, the pagination is functional as well. With that said, Let's expand our app to admire it in its full glory. It's getting more and more finished every second. And right now, it's looking wonderful. We have a great looking hero section with a nice illustration. We immediately show the events, even though the user is locked out. With automatic search and filtering, so we can search for different categories, that works. We have the event detail pages, where we can see all the information about the event, 
and even purchase it. We can navigate to related events and we can also get tickets for those events as well. But the price is zero. That works as well. Not to say that we can also delete events with this great looking pop-up and also update them as well, which opens up this entire form that we have created. It's a big one and it autofills all the data. Let's not forget that we can also create events using it. And we have my profile page where we can see all of the events that we have organized. But hey, did we do this part where we can purchase some events? Yes, we did that too. But this account is just the organizer. We didn't purchase any tickets from there. So all of this is working perfectly. We have phenomenal account management using Clerk. And I don't even have to point it out because we've been looking at it this entire time, but the app is fully mobile responsive. We have been building it mobile first in this case, because we've been looking at the mobile version. Now there is one small tweak I noticed we need to make. And that is if you go to the details page here, we see the pagination, even though we don't have too many things to paginate. So let's search for all instances of where we call the collection. And let's ensure that we're properly passing the total page number like we are here on the homepage. So on the second instance, yep, we hard coded it. So here we have to say total pages is related events dot total pages. And the page is going to be search params dot page as string. We can also make the limit three because we cannot fit more on the details page. Let's go to the next one. Here we have done it properly. And the last one, we have done it properly. Let's also check the next one. Here, we can also set the limit to three and we have done it properly. And the last one also can be a limit of three and we have done it properly here as well. And what that means is that we are done with this entire application. Notice that the search right here in the orders should be working automatically. If we search by buyer name, it actually updates the search. And if I type JavaScript, it works. If I type mastery, it works. If I type something random, it doesn't return anything. So this is it, Evently, the event management platform. And in the JavaScript mastery style, I wanna teach you how to deploy it as well. So going back right here, believe it or not, the only thing we have to do is just open up our terminal, stop the app from running, and then run git add dot git commit dash m finish the app, and then git push. Using Vercel's automatic deployments, our app should automatically be deployed. So let's wait for the deployment to go through and we can check it out. And there we go, our deployment is ready. So we can go ahead and visit our project. I closed all of the other tabs and damn, is this looking great. We have our events right here, we're not logged out, but hey, let's try to just use the app as a regular user. Host, connect, and celebrate. Your events are platform. Okay, let's say that I wanna go to GitHub Universe 2024, or no, it's a bit too expensive. Let's go to the ultimate Next14 workshop. It is free after all. I can see that it is about Next.js. It's happening next Tuesday, and we're gonna learn a lot. And here I can learn a bit more about the event I'll be attending. Now let's try to buy the tickets. Oh, okay. I have to be logged in. That's okay. So let me log in using Google and I can choose my username. So let's do Adrian JSM. We are in, I can go back to that event and I can try to buy it. I can enter my email and complete the order. The purchase has been successful, but unfortunately we are redirected to localhost 3000 and not to our deployed website. But not to worry, that's an easy fix. You can find your project right here, go to settings, and then we have to find environment variables. And here where we have the next public server URL, I believe that's how we called it. It's set to localhost 3000. We can edit it and we can choose the one that we have right here by going to project and then visit. And we can simply edit it right here and save. Once you do that, you have to then redeploy our app. 
So let's wait until it is redeployed. The app has been redeployed. So let's try to go ahead and buy something else. In this case, I'll try to buy this one. Buy ticket. Enter all my details. There we go and click pay. We are successful and we have been redirected to our profile page, which means that everything is working now. Let's not also forget that now if I go to the organizer event, which is in this case, Adrian as well, by logging out and then logging in as the other user, we can go to my profile and see the events we have organized and go to their order details and see all of the people that have purchased. This is great. This was a long video, but hey, if you're here until the end, you've learned many, many great things. You've learned the best practices of using Next14, Tailwind CSS, ShadCN, Server Actions, and more. And if you're really still watching, leave a comment down below. Say, hey, I finished it. I really appreciate you for staying until the end because not a lot of people do. It means you're passionate and it means you want to be the best developer you can be. For that reason, I want to speak with you directly. If you like this video and the project and you haven't yet purchased the Ultimate Next 14 course, I want to let you know that you can do that right now. You can see all of the best practices we talked about. We just dive much deeper into them within the course. Hydration errors, SEO, data fetching, routing, server, server actions, animation, global state management, a lot of stuff we touch on there, and especially how to make your apps optimized. We do it with deep dives where I really illustrate all of the concepts needed to learn XGS. Then we build and deploy a much larger and bigger app than this one, which is our Stack Overflow clone. And then we also have active lessons where you can replicate your knowledge to ensure you have properly learned what's being taught. And of course, there's this phenomenal app that we're going to build, which is the Stack Overflow clone application. You'll learn as much as you can, and you're essentially becoming a top 1% Next.js developer. We also use amazing technologies in there, such as Next.js, TypeScript, MongoDB, ShadCN, and of course, Clerk for authentication. With that said, huge congrats for coming to the end of this video and have a wonderful day.